Madame la Présidente, Honorable Commissaire, Monsieur, Madame les représentants des gouvernements, des institutions internationales, mes amis des ONG de droit de l'homme. Avant d'entamer mon intervention, je vous informe que j'étais empêché de participer à la 62e session de la commission qui s'est tenue dans mon pays, la Mauritanie, par les organisateurs avec d'autres militants de droit de l'homme. En guise de sanction de notre engagement pour les droits humains, je rappelle aussi qu'à l'heure où je vous parle, que des militants anti-esclavagistes sont en prison actuellement. Il s'agit d'Abdallah Salem Mouliali et du député Biram Mouliddah Oulabid. Notre action ne sera pas stompée par les intimidations, la répression et les misèlements de liberté. Nous, nous, nous luttons continuellement pour l'avènement d'un état de droit respectueux des valeurs de la personne humaine. Quant à l'existence de l'esclavage en Mauritanie, qui est une flagrante injustice et discrimination sur tous les plans à l'égard d'une frange importante de la population, il persiste sous ses formes contemporaines et traditionnelles. Certes, tout un arsenal juridique et institutionnel mis en place, mais il demeure inefficace parce qu'il n'est opérationnel qu'à certaines occasions, telles que lors de la session de la Commission africaine de droits de l'homme pour dissimuler cette pratique inhumaine et dégradante. Ainsi, 26 plaintes collectives et individuelles des jeunes filles domestiques victimes de la traite et des violences les plus atroces en Arabie Saoudite méritent un règlement de la part de l'État parti. Madame la Présidente, chers participants et participantes, la, la dégradation des conditions de droits humains dans mon pays, en particulier les victimes de la servitude, et les victimes de la servitude, la persistance de l'impunité inexpliquée des acteurs des exactions extrajudiciaires et des déportations des, des citoyens mauritaniens au Sénégal et au Mali lors des regrettables événements de 1989-91 demeurent sans solution et les victimes attendent toujours une justice transitionnelle pour mettre fin à 25 années de souffrance et d'exclusion. En Mauritanie, comme malheureusement dans la plupart des pays africains, la situation socio-économique, politique et culturelle encore marquée par des inégalités hommes-femmes, ainsi que ainsi des femmes sont les premières victimes de la discrimination. Tout ceci encouragé par une politique de deux poids, deux mesures, maintenue par des préjugés socio-culturels tenaces, encouragés par le pouvoir en place. Les femmes mauritaniennes font l'objet de stigmatisation tendant souvent à les dévaloriser. Elles sont victimes de violences massives de tout genre, de leur, euh, de, euh, de tout genre, de leurs droits les plus élémentaires allant du viol au kidnapping, à la violence domestique, l'esclavage, la traite, les pratiques néfastes, le mariage précoce. Pour ne citer que cela, l'ampleur de ces violences faites aux femmes et aux filles devrait interpeller l'État mauritanien. Pourtant, parti au protocole de Mapito, ce dernier devait donc assurer, assumer ses engagements en prenant des mesures visant à réviser le code du statut personnel, le code de la nationalité pour jeter les bases de, de l'égalité genre. La Mauritanie a l'obligation d'harmoniser ses lois avec la Charte africaine de protection de la femme, la Charte africaine de protection et du bien-être de l'enfant et le protocole de Mapito, etc. Il s'agit des mécanismes africains que nous devons mettre en avant, mais ils demeurent malheureusement méconnus dans notre pays, notamment dans les sphères judiciaires, alors que la Constitution stipule dans son article 80 que tout traité ratifié a autorité sur les lois nationales. En ce qui concerne l'éducation, la situation est catastrophique, sachant qu'un pays ne peut se développer sans un enseignement de qualité et non un système de dilapidation du patrimoine scolaire par la vente des écoles et la marchandisation de l'éducation. De nombreuses écoles publiques à Nouakchott ont été donnés à des personnes influentes pour construire à leur place des marchés, alors que des enfants ici des populations noires, pauvres, si apprenaient et formés. La persistance euh, de non-accès à l'état civil et à la citoyenneté 
Nombreux sont les enfants privés de l'état civil, particulièrement ceux de couches considérées vulnérables, notamment les hratines, les répatriés, les enfants de familles monoparentales dirigées par des femmes, les enfants nus hors mariage ou abandonnés, ainsi que ceux, ceux en situation d'handicap. Notre organisation continue à travailler avec ces victimes afin de permettre d'y accéder et nous exhortons la Commission d'interpeller l'État mauritanien de cesser de bafouer les droits de ces paisibles citoyens et de mettre en place des conventions et protocoles qu'ils ont ratifiés qu ratifié eux-mêmes et décidés volontairement. Même la euh, Madame la Présidente, Honorable Commissaire, la protection des femmes en Mauritanie demeure préoccupante. Elles sont victimes des attaques de courant extrémistes et exposées à des multiples risques face au manque de protection et d'accès à la justice. Pour terminer, je tiens à interpeller votre auguste commission afin qu'elle s'attelle à recueillir les informations fiables sur l'ampleur de la corruption qui gangrène mon pays, considérant les conséquences sur les droits économiques, sociaux, culturels sont très dangereuses et très fâcheuses pour le pays. Merci. Cette description exhaustive des violences constaté dans votre pays, dans la sous-région. Tout ceci est bien noté. Association, association for Media in South Sudan. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Ladies and gentlemen, protocol observe. Your Excellency, Madam Chair, distinguished guest, allow me on behalf of the people of South Sudan who have never seen peace in their lives from one generation to the other to brief you on the situation of freedom of media in South Sudan. The human rights situation in South Sudan should not only be worrying to the people who yearn for peace, but also to the Commission on Human Rights and on Human and People's Rights, the entire continent as well. Freedom of expression, speech and access to information are fundamental to democracy. Principles of good governance in South Sudan and in Africa. Allow me to quote a common saying in South Sudan that what is not said divide us and what is said unite us. And this is the foundation for our freedom of expression in light of peace building and peaceful coexistence. Madam Chair, although the Transitional Constitution 2011 provides for the Bill of Rights and Fundamental Freedoms, access to information, and the events leading to the 2013 crisis pose major threats to fundamental freedom of expression and speech, and this is an obstacle to peace building and reconciliation in a country where the social fabric and social cohesion are broken. The revitalized peace agreement and the resolution of conflict in South Sudan gives hope to the people to get back to normalcy and sustainable peace. However, without allowing for freedom of expression and speech amongst the parties to the agreement, political parties, activists and civil society, the agreement is likely to hit a dead end. <coughs> Implementation and people's hope will be dashed away. Citizens need to get information on the peace agreement, its implementation, so as to participate, and this can be done in a free society that respects fundamental freedoms. South Sudan faces challenges in the implementation of the provision and expression of the freedom of expression and speech. The Media Authority Council has the security, national security organ sitting as a board member, and this poses threat should the media report things that the council deem a threat to national security. The, situation, the South Sudan Union of Journalists, for example, were recently barred from working on pretext that they have not paid the fee to this body. The media authority and access to information laws give the national security and favored powers to arrest detain suspects, monitor communication, conduct searches and seize property. And it also further gives the national security and restricted powers without judicial oversight to clear, without clear limits, exercising these powers. The use of force is contrary to international law and our constitution. 
the abuse of such powers has resulted and allow for illegal arrests, detentions and killing of journalists and closure of media houses by the national security without due process of the law. South Sudan journalists, media practitioners and activists have been killed, arrested for their exercising of the freedom of expression. For example, Isaiah Abraham was killed in 2012 and this is the beginning of crackdown on the media. Many other journalists were killed between 2015 to date. For example, five journalists were murdered on the same day in Western Equatorial State. And this is very worrying to us, and this includes a foreign journalist who was also killed in the battlefield between the government and the opposition uh, parties. Journalists suffer arrest, and often they are warned not to uh, report things that include killing of civilians, the war itself, and corruption. For example, media is also censored as well as telecommunication. You are not free to communicate on your phone in South Sudan. It's being tapped and sometimes it's also used in courts of law as admissible evidence. And this has made people to become uh, self-censored in even conversing with their own ones in uh, using the telephone. Madam Chair, I could say that some online media are already censored. And if people don't have information in a country which is fragile, and then communication becomes a problem and people will not know about security issues. Uh, Madam Chair, as we gather here, the killing and harassment of journalists and others is not only for journalists, but it extends also to other uh, bodies, including civil society actors. We have political detainees, human rights activists and practitioners who are detained at the national security facilities throughout the country, including in opposition areas. Professor Leon from the University of Juba, who is here with us, was detained for five months without due process, and we thank the international human rights bodies who fought for his release. Although the president of South Sudan issued amnesty and the National Human Rights Commission persistently asked for release of these detainees, the national security continued to detain them. Only five out of more than 200 are released. And we have our civil society activists and human rights activists, including Don, Don Samuel and uh, political uh, opponent, Idris, who are kidnapped from Kenya and their fate is still unknown up to date. We have Peter Bier, a young youth activist who is also languishing in the prison under notorious um, uh, bodies from the national security. We recommend, therefore, uh, Madam Chair, that you visit South Sudan as an effort to familiarize yourself with the media situation and also the freedom of expression for civil society and for journalists in a country mad with conflict. We also call your office to give pressure to the African Union and to the government to expedite the process of accountability, including the establishment of the hybrid court. Conclui Madam Chair, Conclui the government needs to review... Conclui Conclui okay, the government needs to review the national uh, media laws and this can only be done if there is a pressure from your office in regards to human rights uh, uh, respect. And therefore, CSO's uh, space, as in many other African countries, is closing. And this is something we request the African Commission to take seriously. Thank you very much. Honorable Chairperson, okay. Commissioners, Representatives of Government and Civil Society, ladies and gentlemen, the Zimbabwe Human Rights NGO Forum, representing civil society organizations in Zimbabwe, welcomes this opportunity to address the Commission on this occasion. Honorable Chairperson, Zimbabwe held its historic plebiscite on the 30th of July 2018. Similar to previous elections, the administration and results of the elections were greatly disputed. Zimbabwe, as a signatory to the African Charter on Democracy and Elections and governance should uphold the principles enshrined in this charter. Honorable Chairperson, 
On 1 August 2018, the military intervened to quell the demonstration by citizens over the perceived delay in the announcement of the presidential elections. The military intervention resulted in the extrajudicial killing of, it, of at least seven civilians in Harare. The aftermath also witnessed retributive attacks on those who had served as election agents for the opposition. A total, a total of 274 cases of post-election human rights violations were documented. The military accounted for 37% of the violence. Honorable Chairperson, we acknowledge the appointment of the Commission of Inquiry to investigate the shooting of civilians on 1 August 2018. Although we, have although we have reservations on the composition of the Commission, as some of the members have openly declared their allegiance to the ruling party. It is our hope that the Commission will not be influenced by political persuasions and will maintain the values of independence, truth, and accountability. Honorable Chairperson, the social, economic, and political situation in Zimbabwe continues on a downward trend, with the ordinary citizens at the receiving end of the debilitating effects. The Minister of, the Minister of Finance, in his recent fiscal policy statement, acknowledged the economic challenges facing the country. The deplorable socioeconomic situation has augmented high unemployment rates and a decline in the provision of basic social services. Prices of basic commodities have skyrocketed, coupled with the scarcity of basic commodities and essential drugs, threatening the rights to food, water, and health care. The growing dissatisfaction with the socioeconomic situation presents a risk of public protests and violence, as was the case with the 1998 food rights and also in 2008. This situation is exacerbated by the lack of transparency by the government, especially in designing economic programs. These challenges raise a red flag of non-accountability regarding the government's economic management and creates a real risk of grand corruption where people's savings are looted in a manner that violates the law and the basic tenets and morals of transparency. As the economic meltdown persists, the government has accelerated its clampdown on in informal traders who found respite in the failed economy. The government continues to disregard the enjoyment of fundamental freedoms such as freedoms to demonstrate and petition and of expression and of the media. On the 11th of October, 42 Zimbabwe Congress of Trade Unions members were arrested countrywide in a bid to stop them from proceeding with their peaceful protest against government's disastrous fiscal and monetary policies. Journalists continue to be assaulted and arrested as they discharge the duties. Zimbabwe Media Institute Zimbabwe documented 15 cases of violations of freedom of the media. We are extremely concerned with the excessive use of force by the police in, de in dealing with vendors and the discriminate assaulting of citizens by the police, particularly in Harare CBD. Honorable Chairperson, Zimbabwe is currently battling a cholera outbreak, a preventable, treatable, and manageable disease that has so far claimed approximately 54 lives and infected 8,831. What is more worrisome is that the main cause of the outbreak is a poor and old sanitary system in the country, lack of access to clean, safe, and portable water. This is a clear demonstration of the government's lack of commitment to provide basic rights and services. We urge the government to fund the health sector in line with the Abuja Declaration that stipulates that at least 15% of national budget should go to public health care funding. The current setup where health care is inadequate has resulted in an over-reliance on out-of-pocket and external financing which are highly unsustainable. It leaves public health institutions at the mercy of well-wishers. Honorable Chairperson, we remain concerned by the violation of civil and political rights taking place with no signs of abating. From the last session, we documented a total of 1,212 cases related to civil and political rights, including torture, abduction, harassment, intimidation, and violation of freedom of, of expression and of the media, amongst others. Zimbabwe has maintained repressive legislation on statute books despite the incom incompatibility with the Constitution. Honorable Chairperson, we note with concern the state's non-compliance with gender equality and equal representation as provided for by the Constitution, in spite of signing and ratifying regional and inter international conventions that advance gender equality and women's rights, Zimbabwe continues to lag behind in implementing the 50% quota system to ensure upholding gender balance. Women's representation in key decision-making institutions such as parliament, local government, and cabinet is far below 50%. 
We therefore appeal to the Commission to urge the government of Zimbabwe to investigate all allegations of human rights violations, prosecute and punish those responsible, and bring justice to the victims. Realign all domestic legislation with the Constitution and fully implement the Constitution. Consider implementation of the gender parity principle in the appointment of senior government positions in line with the constitutional provisions and fulfill its obligations under the Charter in order to ensure the enjoyment of all human rights by its citizens. This African Commission of ours shall remain independent. Thank you, Madam Chair. Merci uh, uh, pour uh, toutes ces préoccupations qui sont bien notées. Nous allons à présent donner la parole à la distinguée délégation de l'Angola. Senhora Presidente, ilustres comissários, minhas senhoras e meus senhores, gostaria, antes de mais, em nome do Estado angolano, apresentar os nossos cumprimentos à Senhora Presidente da Comissão, Soyata Maiga. É para nós uma honra participar em mais uma sessão deste importante Fórum de Direitos Humanos do nosso continente. O contexto atual do continente é heterogêneo. O nosso continente debate-se entre os países que gozam uma certa estabilidade política e democracia e os que convivem com conflitos, terrorismo ou outro tipo de situações preocupantes, para além da atual crise económica global que nos afeta a todos. Mesmo num contexto de crise mundial e de diversificação da economia a nível nacional, o nosso programa do Governo 2018-2022 mantém como compromissos principais a defesa dos direitos humanos de todos os cidadãos, com foco nos mais vulneráveis, o diálogo com a sociedade civil, o combate ao crime organizado, a corrupção, a erradicação da pobreza, entre outros. Senhora Presidente, a nível dos direitos humanos, os desafios continuam numa altura em que celebramos os 70 anos da Declaração Universal dos Direitos Humanos, o primeiro documento que conseguiu um grande consenso em torno de um facto primordial à proteção da dignidade humana. Após graves acontecimentos e as barbáries da Segunda Guerra Mundial, os membros das Nações Unidas concordaram que todas as pessoas devem ter direitos pelo facto de serem seres humanos e que estes direitos são universais, inalienáveis, indivisíveis, interdependentes e interrelacionados. No momento da promulgação da Declaração Universal dos Direitos Humanos, o contexto africano era de colonização pelas potências europeias, mas após o processo de descolonização, rapidamente se tornaram parte desta, deste importante documento. O compromisso africano com os direitos humanos não ficou por aí. A África, independente no âmbito da extinta Organização de Unidade Africana, promulgada em 1981, a Carta Africana dos Direitos Humanos e dos Povos, ratificada por 53 dos 54 países que compõem o continente, sendo o único documento de direitos humanos que inclui não só uma perspectiva individual dos direitos humanos, como também coletiva, comunitária, a defesa dos nossos povos, da nossa soberania e independência. Desde então até agora, muitos são os avanços e também os desafios existentes. Promover a igualdade e a não discriminação, a implementação progressiva dos direitos econômicos, sociais e culturais, melhorar o acesso à justiça, à cidadania, entre outros. Mas existem programas, planos para superar esta situação a nível do continente como a Agenda Africana de Desenvolvimento 2063, enraizada no panafricanismo sobre a África que queremos, e a Agenda Africana para o Bem-Estar da Criança 2040. O lema dos 70 anos da Declaração Universal dos Direitos Humanos, todos nascemos livres e iguais com dignidade e direitos, é muito pertinente. Realça o que nos une e constitui a essência dos direitos humanos. Senhora Presidente, distintos comissários, minhas senhoras e meus senhores, a nível de Angola, gostaríamos de explicar que o atual contexto político e social é muito favorável para superar estes desafios. Após um ano de governação do novo presidente, João Manuel Gonçalves Lourenço, as diretrizes são claras e assim foram incluídas no Plano de Desenvolvimento Nacional 2018-2022, denominado 
melhorar o que está bem e corrigir o que está mal. O plano propõe criar instituições de justiça fortes e com capacidades para assegurarem o exercício da cidadania e a observância dos direitos humanos. Nesse sentido, o Governo irá brevemente aprovar uma Estratégia para os Direitos Humanos 2018-2022 e tem como base sustentação legal a Constituição da República de Angola e os tratados internacionais ratificados, designadamente a Declaração Universal e a Carta Africana dos Direitos Humanos e dos Povos, bem como os compromissos de Angola a quando da sua eleição para o Conselho de Direitos Humanos 2018-2020. Os nossos objetivos são bem claros e concretos. Primeiro, conquistar a autonomia interna em termos de autoavaliação, denúncia, condenação e correção das falhas, num processo conducente à maioridade nacional em direitos humanos, diminuindo o paternalismo externo, que muitas vezes Angola é orientada, avaliada, denunciada e condenada por organizações de direitos humanos consideradas independentes. Segundo, tornar Angola numa referência internacional em direitos humanos mediante a consolidação do seu papel junto das organizações internacionais de direitos humanos. Para atingir esses objetivos de elevado alcance cívico e patriótico, as seguintes ações podem constituir um meio adequado, o reforço do sistema de direitos humanos a nível provincial, de suma importância, numa altura em que nos prepararmos para realizar as primeiras eleições autárquicas. Reforço da articulação e parceria com a sociedade civil, formação e educação em direitos humanos, programas e ações para uma cultura endógena em direitos humanos, reforço do combate ao tráfico de seres humanos e reforço da presença de Angola nas principais instituições internacionais de direitos humanos. É importante reiterar que Angola está disposta a reforçar a cooperação com esta comissão, com a Comissão Africana dos Direitos Humanos e dos Povos, em todos os domínios, tal como faz com as demais instituições parceiras internacionais. Ressaltar que, atualmente, Angola cumpriu com todos os compromissos com a Comissão. Realizou uma sessão da mesma, em 2014, a 55ª, e recebeu visita dos comissários e relatores africanos. Do mesmo modo, apresentou os seus relatórios. Com agrado, verificamos que Angola está na lista dos cerca de 20 países que têm cumprido com as obrigações junto da Comissão. A nível das Nações Unidas, Angola foi eleita como membro do Conselho de Direitos Humanos para o período 2018-2020, comprometendo-se a atingir diversos objetivos. No âmbito da proteção dos direitos da criança, ressaltar que em 2017 defendemos o relatório de implementação da Carta Africana dos Direitos e Bem-Estar da Criança e em maio de 2018 os relatórios da Convenção dos Direitos da Criança e os seus dois protocolos adicionais sobre a criança envolvida em conflito armado e sobre a venda de crianças, prostituição e pornografia infantil. Angola está num processo dinâmico e evolutivo onde aprende diariamente as boas práticas do respeito pelos direitos humanos, com base em novas realidades políticas, econômicas, sociais e culturais. Senhora Presidente, distintos comissários, minhas senhoras e meus senhores, antes de terminar, gostaríamos de informar que foram feitas referências aqui nesta sessão pela Presidente da Comissão, Senhora Soyata Maiga, sobre alegadas violações dos direitos humanos dos migrantes e a morte de 10 pessoas. Tal como referido acima, o programa do governo prioriza o combate ao crime organizado e é neste contexto que se realiza a Operação Transparência e visa sete províncias do país. O foco principal desta intervenção é a proteção contra os crimes ambientais, trabalho forçado, incluindo infantil e crimes econômicos. Tal como diz a nota do nosso Ministério das Relações Exteriores e do Ministério do Interior, a operação abrangiu cidadãos de várias nacionalidades, incluindo os angolanos e outros. E não é dirigida 
a cidadãos da República Democrática do Congo. Entretanto, verificamos que há uma tentativa de aproveitamento da situação ao colocarem imagens que nada têm a ver sobre a operação nas redes sociais e na mídia. Esta informação foi passada pelas nossas autoridades ao embaixador da República Democrática do Congo em Angola e confirmadas pelas agências das Nações Unidas que estão no país. Senhora Presidente, pela credibilidade, objetividade e imparcialidade e não politização desta comissão, Angola alerta para que, em caso de alegações de violações dos direitos humanos por um Estado, parte, a Comissão deve ouvir o Estado e não fundar a sua opinião com falsas informações. Minhas senhoras e meus senhores, termino reafirmando que a República de Angola defende o diálogo como base da resolução de qualquer problema e está disponível para contribuir para que o nosso continente seja pacífico e onde se respeite os direitos humanos. Muito obrigada. Merci distingué délégué. Je crois que vous ne faites qu'enfoncer une porte ouverte. Dans notre déclaration, nous avons bien parlé d'allégations et ces allégations sont largement ressorties de plusieurs sources. Maintenant, vous êtes là, vous avez l'opportunité et nous, nous aurons la chance euh, effectivement d'engager de, les discussions et euh, de vous entendre euh, sur euh, ces faits, en tout cas, qui nous paraissent assez graves. Euh, je voudrais donner la parole à la délégation de l'Algérie. La délégation de l'Algérie. Merci. Merci, Madame la Présidente, Honorable Commissaire, Mesdames et Messieurs. Les Nations Unies célèbrent cette année le 70e anniversaire de l'adoption de la Déclaration universelle des droits de l'homme, source d'inspiration des rédacteurs des pactes, traités et autres conventions qui constituent aujourd'hui l'architecture des droits de l'homme et dont notre charte et ses protocoles additionnels en sont la parfaite illustration. Depuis cette date devenue une référence, l'humanité a accompli de grandes réalisations sur la voie de la liberté, de l'émancipation et de la dignité. Mais il reste encore du chemin à parcourir, y compris sur notre continent. L'agenda 2063 et les objectifs du développement durable 2030 constituent une prise de conscience salutaire dans la perspective d'une prise en charge de la problématique du développement et de son corollaire, les droits de l'homme. Notre commission se doit d'être le catalyseur et l'espace de mobilisation permanente guidé par un esprit d'ouverture et d'écoute réciproque pour relever dans la concertation les multiples défis démographiques, environnementaux, migratoires, socio-économiques à l'origine des tragédies humaines qui se déroulent sous nos yeux avec leur lot de victimes malheureusement chaque jour plus important. Elle doit rester dépolitisée dans ces débats et mettre en exergue la diversité des cultures, des civilisations et des conditions socio-économiques propres à chaque pays, à chaque région. L'Algérie s'efforce dans le cadre de la réforme législative consécutive à la révision constitutionnelle de février 2006 d'adapter son arsenal juridique qui encadre les libertés d'association, de réunion, de manifestation, d'opinion et d'expression, de démocratie participative ainsi que de gouvernance locale à travers un certain nombre d'amendements. Permettez-moi en cette occasion de vous entretenir du calendrier de mise en œuvre des textes d'application de la révision constitutionnelle de février 2016 et qui a permis en un laps court de temps l'adoption d'une loi portant l'organisation et, et le fonctionnement des deux chambres du Parlement et leurs relations avec le gouvernement, d'une loi organique relative à la haute instance indépendante de surveillance des élections, d'une loi sur le régime électoral, d'une loi portant institution d'un Conseil national des droits de l'homme, d'une loi sur la protection des données personnelles, d'une loi sur l'exception de constitutionnalité et d'une loi 
portant amendement du code de procédure pénale, du, coût, du code pénal, sur le degré de double juridiction, sur les peines de substitution et sur l'empreinte génétique. Depuis notre dernière session, notre, mon pays et outre les deux rendez-vous électoraux sous la supervision d'une autorité indépendante et qui ont conduit au renouvellement de l'Assemblée nationale et des assemblées locales et régionales où siège l'ensemble des partis politiques agréés. C'est le lieu de souligner que la représentation des femmes dépasse les 30%, ce qui est une juste consécration, une orientation politique convaincue et souverainement assumée. Et c'est pour faire le point sur cette question que l'Algérie a organisé, avec le concours du programme des Nations Unies pour le Développement, une conférence internationale où elle a exposé son expérience en la matière et tiré profit des expériences d'autres pays invités pour la circonstance sur cette question. C'est ici le lieu de dire que mon pays qui a choisi la voie ambitieuse de la matérialisation des droits de l'homme au moyen de la promotion du pluralisme démocratique, du développement humain, de l'accès aux droits fondamentaux comme l'alimentation, l'éducation, la santé, ainsi que la garantie de revenus décents à tous ses citoyens, avec une attention particulière aux personnes handicapées, aux seniors et aux enfants. Madame la Présidente, Honorable Commissaire, Mesdames et Messieurs, nombre de questions sont inscrites à votre ordre du jour. Elles sont toutes pertinentes et soulignent l'intérêt que vous portez les uns et les autres à des thématiques présente et en devenir. La situation de l'occupation par la force et en violation de la légalité internationale du territoire non autonome du Sahara occidental, dernière colonie d'Afrique, mérite que l'on s'y attarde. Mon pays, terre d'asile des réfugiés sahraouis, depuis plus de 40 ans, n'a de cesse de rappeler la responsabilité historique des Nations Unies vis-à-vis -vis de ce territoire et de sa population. L'absence d'une composante droit de l'homme dans la mission des Nations Unies pour le référendum du Sahara occidental dénommé MINURSO est un paradoxe qui n'existe dans aucune autre mission des Nations Unies. C'est pourquoi votre commission se doit de protéger par son autorité morale les populations sahraouies qui se trouvent dans les territoires occupés et rappeler au Royaume du Maroc, bien qu'il n'ait pas ratifié la charte, qu'il a des devoirs en tant qu'État membre de l'Union africaine. Je vous remercie. Merci, euh, distingué délégué. Euh, nous félicitons l'Algérie pour euh, tous ces développements positifs intervenus depuis la dernière session et euh, l'engageant pour euh, continuer les efforts dans tous les domaines de droit. Uh, honorable Madam Chairperson, Honorable Commissioners, Madam Secretary of the African Commission for Human Rights and uh, People's Rights, uh, distinguished state delegates, uh, dear representative of national human rights institutions, uh, distinguished representative of national and international NGOs, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, it's my privilege and honor to present on behalf of the government of Rwanda uh, this statement at this 63rd Uh, session of uh, ordinary session of the African Commission on Human Rights uh, to highlight the situation of the human rights in Rwanda. Uh, the statement highlights few notable developments since the last appearance during the six, six second ordinary session held in Nouakchott, Mauritania. Mad Madam Chair, allow me first take this opportunity always to thank the Commission for having successfully convened this session. At the outset, I wish to reaffirm Rwanda's commitment to upholding its international human rights obligations. Rwanda maintains its commitment to the protection, respect, and promotion of human rights. Rwanda's commitment is based on good faith with the view of ensuring that its citizens enjoy all the rights protected by the law and its constitution. Madam Chair, Honorable Commissioners, uh, Rwanda is determined to uphold, uphold the democratic principles in relation to its constitution. Uh, first, the election uh, that were held in September 2018, uh, they were organized to enable people with disabilities to easily cast their votes. In this regard, the National Commission, Electoral Commission, printed special ballot papers 
that were used by the vision impaired persons to make sure that they cast their votes individually without being assisted as it was originally the case. Uh, secondly, to make sure that the physically handicapped persons cast their votes in consideration of the Rwandan geographical tenant, the National Electoral Commission erected temporary polling stations that were easily accessible for them. Uh, with regard always with the improvement that made during the election, in, uh, the, during the concluded parliamentary election in September, the commission put polling stations in 34 major hospitals countrywide to enable sick attendance, their attendance and the medical staff on duty to cast their votes. In the past election, this category of people did not cast their vote. The commission also, with, with uh, the collaboration with the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Rwandan embassies and the High Commission, as they established 155 polling stations in the embassies across the world. This increased the number of voters in diaspora from 40,000 to 45,000 uh, compared to the, electoral, uh, commission, the, party, the presidential election in 2017. Uh, this election confirmed the Rwanda's commitment to upholding the principle of equality between men and women, as still Rwanda still lead with the 61% of seats which are concurrently occupied by women. Last but not least, two more new political parties, one seat in uh, political parties, one seat in the parliament, consequently, and all registered parties have seats in the parliament. This shows the inclusive leadership that Rwanda has opted for. Madam Chair, with regard to the protection, the government of Rwanda continues to enact laws that further guarantee the protection of human rights. During this period under consideration, the government of Rwanda adopted a new law determining offenses and penalties, uh, the Penal Code, which repealed the Penal Code of 2012. The highlights, the progress we can mention this new law, the law repealed the press offenses, particularly defamation. In addition to that, the law removed all provisions that hindered women and girls from accessing safe legal abortion. Further with this law, the court order which was required for women and girls to access legal abortion was removed and the child defilement was added among the exceptions under which a minor can seek legal abortion. Moreover, the new law determining the offense and penalties in general provide the alternatives, penalties rather than imprisonment for those convicted of minor offenses. This is expected to improve prison conditions, particularly addressing the issue of overcrowding. Madam Chair, Honorable Commissioners, uh, during the same period, Rwanda revised uh, law determining the organization, the mission, and functioning of the National Commission for Human Rights. This law expanded, expanded the mandate of the National Commission for Human Rights, and as such, since 24th August 2018, the National Commission for Human Rights doubles as also the national preventive mechanism as provided under the UN Optional Protocol and Convention Against Torture. Uh, the government adopted many laws during this uh, period. Uh, what I can mention is that the law relating to prevention, suppression, and uh, trafficking, uh, human trafficking and exploitation of others the law on uh, crime of genocide ideology and related crimes, the revision of the law regulating labor in Rwanda, the law governing political and uh, organizations, uh, faith-based organizations, laws of fighting against corruption, law on counterterrorism, and protection, the law on the protection of the child. With the view to further improve access to justice for all citizens, the government have reduced court fees between 40% and 60%. So no fees are required now to file a case before the Supreme Court, as it was opposed before it was 100,000 franc, 100 francs. It has changed. Remaining on this point, it is worth it to note that in, from February 2018, Rwanda has established the Court of Appeal, which now is functional since September 2018. And uh, what I have also to highlight is that uh, since 2018, Rwanda has now a new forensic laboratory which was launched with the capacity to conduct DNA tests among other additional services. This will greatly contribute in getting evidences related to gender-based violence and will be less time consuming and cost effective compared with the previous experience where the tests were had to be sent to you, be performed in Europe, in particular in Germany. Uh, the government of Rwanda also established the Rwanda Investigation Bureau. 
uh, which demonstrates also Rwanda's commitment to ensuring rule of law, justice, and safety of the citizens. It will improve professionalism and efficiency in the investigations of crimes and handling of evidence, which in turn will positively impact on the criminal justice process as a whole. Madam Chair, worth, uh, worth is also to mention that with regarding to promotion of human rights, we are, we are pleased to inform the Honorable Commission that the government of Rwanda and its stakeholders continue to organize trainings and sessions and hold public talks on diverse human rights topics. Uh, with regard to Rwanda's reporting obligation, we are pleased to inform the Commission that during the period under consideration, Rwanda submitted its fourth and fifth periodic reports on the African Charter on the Rights of Welfare of the Child and the combined fifth and sixth periodic report on the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Madam Chairperson, Honorable Commissioners, moving to the conclusion. Allow me to reiterate the government of Rwanda's strong commitment and readiness to continue collaborating with this honorable commission and all stakeholders to advance human rights while remaining open to any positive and constructive engagement in that regard. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, honorable commissioners. Merci, distinguée délégué de Rwanda. Nous félicitons votre pays pour toutes ces nouvelles mesures euh, positives qui euh, viennent renforcer le cadre euh, normatif, euh, en particulier dans le domaine de la promotion euh, des droits des femmes et, et de l'égalité des genres. Nous notons euh, également avec satisfaction euh, les dispositions euh, nouvelles pour euh, l'accès à l'avortement euh, euh, légal et en conformité avec euh, euh, le protocole de Maputo et euh, également euh, toutes ces dispositions qui sont prises pour euh, favoriser un plus grand et un meilleur accès des populations au service public de la justice. Ceci dit, nous voulons également, euh, Madame la distinguée déléguée, profiter de cette occasion pour euh, féliciter le Rwanda pour euh, l'élection de Madame Louise Mouchikibao à la tête de l'Organisation internationale de la francophonie, une institution très importante avec laquelle la Commission a signé un mémorandum d'entente en janvier 2018. Nous le souhaitons euh, plein succès dans ces nouvelles fonctions. Euh, la parole est à présent à la distinguée délégation du Cameroun. Sept minutes, s'il vous plaît. Merci. The Cameroonian delegation that I'm honored to head is pleased to take part in the deliberations of the 63rd session of the African Commission on Human Rights, Human and People's Rights. Let me join previous speakers to express my gratitude to the government of the Gambia for the facilities availed to my delegation. Madam Chairperson, Cameroon welcomes the opportunity for dialogue which this session offers. It allows for the exchange of ideas on human rights issues, which require the participation of all stakeholders. Since the last session, Cameroon has pursued a strategic option for human rights with a view to protecting the most vulnerable, despite security constraints in some regions of the country. As you know, my country recently had one of its key historic moments with the holding of presidential elections on 7 October 2018. The ballot gave an opportunity to Cameroonians to choose their next president. All observers acclaimed the peace and calm that prevailed during the election. The Constitutional Council, which is the institution responsible for assessing the regularity and sincerity of electoral operations, after examining litigations related thereto, proclaimed the results. Before the elections, contending candidates committed themselves to respecting a code of good conduct. We hope that these commitments shall be kept. In spite of certain challenges, voting was effective throughout the national territory. 
for the state took measures to address various security threats and guarantee the right to vote of all citizens. The approach of the state to the various crises Cameroon faces has not been focused solely on security. It is multidimensional. As regards the crisis in the administrative regions of the North, West, and Southwest, the head of state addressed and satisfied all the grievances raised by the teachers and lawyers in 2016. Notwithstanding the good intentions of the government, the process was hijacked by separatists with the aim of fostering an insurrection. Due to the escalation of acts of violence and barbarism on the civilian population, political, administrative, and religious authorities, as well as on members of our defense and security forces, the security re response remains a necessity. Madam Chair, the separatists claim to be fighting for their rights and fighting marginalization. That leads me to ask a question or a series of questions. What cause can justify the denial of the fundamental rights of individuals? What cause can justify the violation of the right of children to go to school? What cause can justify the transformation of schools into military bases? What cause can justify the recruitment of child soldiers? What cause can justify threats and intimidation on people to prevent them from going about their normal business? In these circumstances, the state is under an obligation to maintain public order and ensure the security of persons and property. Therefore, it must protect citizens and their property. In response to these multiple acts of violence and barbarism, defense and security forces are still deployed in the Northwest and Southwest regions in order to guarantee the maintenance of order while abiding to the rules of engagement that take into account the requirements of professionalism, responsibility, proportionality, and restraint. Madame la Présidente, au plan judiciaire, les procédures ouvertes contre les personnes interpellées dans le cadre de cette crise se déroulent dans le respect de leurs droits. Elles continuent de bénéficier dans ce sens de toutes les garanties liées à la tenue de procès justes et équitables. Au-delà de la réponse sécuritaire, l'État a décidé de la mise en œuvre d'un plan d'assistance humanitaire d'urgence pour ces régions. Le plan a reçu la contribution significative des différentes couches de la société camerounaise traduisant le fort élan de solidarité nationale auquel les partenaires sont en train de s'associer. Dans un autre chapitre, Madame la Présidente, mon pays continue de faire face aux attaques du groupe terroriste Boko Haram. Bien que la capacité de nuisance de ce groupe ait été considérablement réduite grâce aux efforts concertés et coordonnés des pays du bassin de, du lac Tchad, il demeure une menace permanente au regard des attaques suicides et enlèvements sporadiques. Le gouvernement a entrepris de, entrepris de reconstruire le tissu social et les infrastructures économiques détruites dans les régions affectées par ces attaques. L'encadrement et la réinsection des repentis de ce groupe constituent un défi majeur pour le gouvernement puisqu'il faut les soustraire de l'emprise du groupe terroriste et les protéger contre d'éventuelles représailles. Par ailleurs, l'encadrement des personnes réfugiées et déplacées internes demeure une réelle préoccupation à laquelle l'État s'efforce d'apporter des solutions. À ce titre, le gouvernement, sous la très haute impulsion du chef de l'État, continue d'œuvrer dans le sens du respect des 
de ses obligations internationales, toujours dans une approche inclusive, intégrant les différentes parties prenantes. Madame la Présidente, je ne saurais terminer mon propos sans signaler l'élection du Cameroun au Conseil des droits de l'homme des Nations Unies. Le fait que cette élection coïncide avec le début du septennat du président de la République témoigne, à mon humble avis, de l'importance que ce dernier continuera d'accorder aux questions des droits de l'homme au cours de ce mandat. Elle nous encourage dans la logique de la longue coopération avec les mécanismes des droits de l'homme, avec en première place la Commission africaine des droits de l'homme et des peuples, à laquelle nous nous engageons à apporter notre total soutien dans l'accomplissement de ces missions. Je vous remercie de votre aimable attention. Merci, euh, distingué délégué. La Commission africaine avait marqué et continue de marquer sa préoccupation par rapport aux défis sécuritaires que le Cameroun rencontre depuis un certain temps et euh, leurs conséquences. Et <coughs> l'engage à tout mettre en œuvre pour euh, le retour de la paix et de la sécurité. Euh, afin euh, de pouvoir euh, euh, conduire les projets et les programmes de développement euh, sur tout le territoire national. Et euh, nous l'engageons également à veiller au respect des droits de l'homme, de tous, de tous, en, en, y compris par euh, les forces de l'ordre et de la sécurité. Nous félicitons également le Cameroun qui, euh, malgré ce contexte difficile, a réussi euh, à, à organiser et à conduire euh, les élections présidentielles. Merci également pour le soutien exprimé euh, en faveur du travail de la Commission africaine des droits de l'homme et des peuples. Ah oui, le, le vice-président euh, me rappelle également que nous... Nous allons vous saisir incessamment d'une euh, note verbale à l'effet de nous autoriser à effectuer une euh, mission d'établissement des faits. On nous reproche souvent de euh, dire euh, ou d'exprimer des préoccupations par rapport à des, élég... à des, élég... à des allégations sans auparavant euh, prendre... Euh, contact ou langue avec euh, les États partis. Donc, euh, nous souhaitons, dans le cadre des efforts qui sont faits justement euh, par le Cameroun euh, par rapport au retour de la paix et de la sécurité, pouvoir effectuer cette mission d'établissement des faits pour, par nous-mêmes, constater effectivement ces efforts et certainement euh, euh, rencontrer euh, toutes les franges de la, la société camerounaise. Ceci met à fin à la liste des euh, États partis qui souhaitent à ce stade prendre la parole. Euh, à présent, euh, nous donnons euh, la parole à Zimbabwe Lawyer for Human Rights, International Center for euh, euh, Non-Profit Law. Il doit se préparer. Cinq minutes, s'il vous plaît. The Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Commissioners, State Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen, following the updates presented at the 62nd session in Mauritania, the human rights situation in Zimbabwe remains precarious. Harmonized elections were conducted on 30 July 2018 that produced a contested presidential outcome. Following the election, a relatively calm and peaceful atmosphere that prevailed prior quickly turned violent on 1 August 2018. Members of the Zimbabwe National Army fired live ammunition on protesters in the streets of Harare. These protesters were agitated by a perceived delay in the release of the presidential results as they feared manipulation of the result. At least seven confirmed deaths of unarmed protesters and bystanders with many others sustaining injuries such as gunshot wounds. The role of the army in civilian and governance issues remains a major concern. 
the socio-economic situation has deteriorated further. The shortage of cash has reached critical unprecedented levels fueling a parallel market that has led to price increases of basic commodities, making this unaffordable for the ordinary person. Prices of basic commodities have skyrocketed over the last few weeks. Some businesses have shut down, resulting in people losing jobs. Queues for fuel, cash, and other basic commodities have re-emerged in a manner reminiscent of 2007 to 2009 period. The country continues to battle outbreaks of waterborne diseases such as cholera, which has resulted in the death of an estimated 40 people. These deaths could have been avoided had the proper investment into clean water, sanitation, and sewer reticulation been prioritized since the country has had this challenge before. Of concern is the fact that access to potable water remains unaddressed. There has been very little investment to improve the infrastructure at schools. Most parents are not able to pay school fees on time and their children have been denied access to their examination results. Unemployment remains very high and continues to increase. Those resorting to informal trading still encounter numerous challenges of never-ending battles with the municipal police, arrest by the police, and confiscation of their wares. Following the promise of free, fair, and credible elections, the results of the elections were highly contested on allegations of manipulated figures in favor of the incumbent president. The enjoyment of civil rights remains curtailed after elections. Recently, the police arbitrarily arrested leaders of the Zimbabwe Congress of Trade Union around the country for organizing peaceful demonstrations. 29 were arrested, whilst 26 were detained at their offices. Whilst the Commission of Inquiry into the killings of 1 August 2018 has been set up to investigate the killings, the terms of reference of the Commission leaves a lot to be desired, as seemingly it legitimizes the intervention of the army as opposed to interrogating why armed soldiers were displayed against civilians in the first place. The Zimbabwe Human Rights Commission is still under-resourced. This has limited its capacity to fulfill its human rights protection mandate. The National Peace and Reconciliation Commission that is supposed to be addressing transitional justice-related issues is also underfunded to effectively dis discharge its constitutional mandate. Repressive laws that negatively impact on enjoyment of fundamental rights and freedoms have not been repealed. Further, the institutions that must be at the forefront of protecting human rights, such as the police, the National Prosecuting Authority, are yet to be reformed. Zetile Chara therefore urges the Commission to call upon the government of Zimbabwe to return to a full constitutional democracy where the army has no role in civilian affairs, Guarantee the safety of citizens from state security agents as they exercise their constitutionally enshrined civil and political rights. Provide adequate funding towards solving the perennial water challenges in the country. Provide adequate resources and guarantee independence of institutions supporting democracy. And align all laws with the constitution and reform institutions for them to effectively and and efficiently discharge their constitutional mandate. This African Commission of ours shall remain independent. I thank you. Merci. Vos préoccupations sont bien notées. International Center for Non-Profit Law et uh, International work, Working Group on Indigenous Affairs. Le droit se préparer. Your Excellency, Madam Chairperson, Honorable Commissioners, Distinguished Delegates, on behalf of the International Center for Not-for-Profit Law, I thank you for the opportunity to present this statement. ICNL continues to work with partners on the continent to promote and protect the freedoms of association and assembly and ensure an enabling legal framework for African civil society. In this endeavor, the guidelines on freedom of association and assembly in Africa, adopted in 2017 as some of the most progressive norms and standards globally, remain an important tool for states 
national human rights institutions, civil society, and for this honorable commission. Much work remains to be done to ensure that the guidelines are effectively used to protect and expand civic space at national and regional levels. ICNL is committed to continuing its support for initiatives to popularize and implement the guidelines in collaboration with regional African civil society networks in southern, central, east, and west Africa. The guidelines have been a useful reference document for a range of countries developing new laws or revising laws with an impact on civic space. These include countries which have evidenced commitment to improving legal regulatory frameworks, including Ethiopia's Charities and Societies Proclamation, Rwanda's laws governing national and international NGOs, and Zambia's NGO law. The guidelines will also be a critical tool for assessing adherence of more restrictive NGO policies and laws to international law and best practices. These include association laws of Burundi, Kenya's association bill, then the DRC associations bill, and Nigeria's NGO regulation bill. We respectfully request the Commission to monitor and encourage implementation of these guidelines, not only by assessing compliance of existing and proposed national laws and policies with these norms, but also by hosting trainings for government, NGO regulators, national human rights institutions and civil society on the content of the guidelines, documenting success stories, and updating the Commission's 2014 report on freedom of association and assembly to reflect current state compliance with international norms. ICNL stands ready to assist in these efforts for and with this African Commission of ours, which shall be independent. I thank you for your attention. Ms. Gia. Madam Chairperson, Honorable Commissioners, State Representatives, and members of the civil society organizations, I make this statement on behalf of Reporters Without Borders, Swedish section. The focus is the situation of human rights in Eritrea, and in particular, the issue of media freedom. We have just seen a promising development with a peace agreement between Eritrea and Ethiopia. It should bring hope. But fundamentally, nothing has changed for the imprisoned journalists in Eritrea. They are still imprisoned without sentence, isolated from the world at in undisclosed locations. <clears throat> Several of them have been in detention for more than 17 years, and for 17 years, all free media have been banned in Eritrea. This, ha this is something which must end. We also take note of another ominous recent development. The former finance minister, Mr. Brahane Abrahe Kidane, has just been detained after publishing a book in September 2018. A couple of days ago, the daughter of one of the imprisoned journalists, Mr. Siyum Tsahaye, told us to ask in this statement where her father is. Where is Siyum Tsahaye? Abi Siyum was a young child when her father was taken away. She has the right to know, she also wants to see him, that the prisoners are not allowed any visits, is cruel both on them and their families. It violates their rights and they should be granted visits. They should be released immediately. Excuse me. This commission has made these demands in two decisions already. In, result, in, in communication 275 from 2003, communication 428 from 2012. Eritrea has so far not respected the decisions of the Commission. We have repeatedly asked for information from the Eritrean government in letters and here on what they are doing to live up to the African Charter as pointed out by the Commission in several occasions. We have received no reply. 
we may may we once again ask the government of Eritrea to clarify what it has done to honor the decisions in communication 275 and 428. Since the peace agreement with Ethiopia, there has been rumors that the journalists as well as other political prisoners would be released. When will these rumors become true? Given the personal conditions and the long term the long time in detention, we fear for the lives of our colleagues. There is no time to lose. As long as the press ban in Eritrea remains in place, and as long as the journalists are detained, we request, we kindly request the Commission to hold an implementation hearing with Eritrea. Why does the government in Asmara not heed the calls in communications 275 and 428. And finally, we underscore that Eritrea continues to violate many of its treaty obligations, such as those related to the Robben Island guidelines, the Arusha Declaration, the UN standard minimum rules for the treatment of prisoners, to name a few. But the most relevant here is the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. Human rights violations in Eritrea should stop immediately and all imprisoned journalists and political prisoners must be released now. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. Merci. Les préoccupations sont notées. Je voudrais à présent euh, donner la parole à l'estimé délégation du Royaume de Swatini. Royaume Eswatini. Sept minutes. Merci. Your Excellency, Madam Chairperson, Honorable Commissioners, Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen. Madam Chairperson, since I'm taking the floor for the first time, may I kindly be allowed to express our appreciation as the Kingdom of Swaziland to the Commission and the Secretariat for the successful hosting of this session. May I also extend our gratitude to the government and the people of the Islamic Republic of the Gambia for the warmth and hospitality afforded us since our arrival here in the smiling kingdom of, uh, in the smiling coast of Africa. Allow me, Madam Chairperson, at the outset to also highlight uh, major strikes uh, taken by the kingdom of Eswatini since the last session held in Mauritania in May. The kingdom has recently held its national elections, which saw members of parliament installed and a new government being put in place. It's presently in the process of electing, or rather appointing a prime minister, as that is the sole mandate of his majesty which we hope will be done today. We also had quite a number of uh, electoral observers from various institutions particip participating in the process. And the elections were said to be free and fair by all the observers. Madam Chairperson, the results of the election shows an improvement in the balance between men and women. But we do acknowledge that we still have a long way to go before gender equality can be achieved. The reflection on the process indicates that women participated in the process, but not many of them met it to the end. However, we take comfort in the fact that the, Honor the House of Assembly nominated and voted an equal number of both men and women into the Senate. Furthermore, His Majesty the King, in his constitutional quota, appointed a fair number of women into the House of Assembly and Senate. Uh, Chairperson, we're also pleased to share with this August House that a number of laws aimed at strengthening the promotion of human rights in the kingdom have been enacted since uh, the last, before the last parliament was dissolved in May. This includes inter alia the Election of Women Act, which will facilitate the election of former women, one per region, to enhance the number of women 
in, uh, the, in, the, in both houses so as to reach the 30% uh, quota allocated, uh, prescribed by our constitution. We also saw the enactment of the Sexual Offences and Domestic Violence Act, which had been long awaited. And it is worth mentioning that the legislature, this legislation rather, provides extensive protections for a number of rights and freedoms, especially relating to the protection of women and the girl child. Since the enactment of legislation, or still on the enactment of legislation, Madam Chair, I uh, would like to also highlight that the Public Order Act was also passed, and this act signific significantly expanded the freedom of speech association assembly in the kingdom. Ever since this law came into force, we've seen a number of marches, peaceful marches, I may hasten to add, and protest action around the country with thousands of participants and almost entirely, almost entirely without incidents. Chairperson, the, the, this, uh, I would say, was attributed, can be attributed to the fact that both the law enforcers and the trade organizations adhered to the laws in place. However, in any working environment, uh, there are bound to be incidents. As in some of our cases, uh, many, uh, the civil society has also highlighted that there were some incidents involving the police and demonstrators. We will acknowledge that. And this, some of these resulted in injuries to both the police and the civilians. In the circumstance, uh, Madam Chair, the Commission on Human Rights in the country took up these cases and they are still under investigation. However, it should be noted that in some of these instances, uh, the, 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 the cause of this were the financial constraints that all uh, countries worldwide are experiencing. The protests were as a result of grievances around economic frustrations. Madam Chairperson, as you may all be aware, the Kingdom of Eswatini is also facing financial challenges. And this is being addressed. We hope the new parliament will also uh, take uh, due steps to address these financial problems. The relevant bodies in the country are also working around the clock to find solutions to these uh, problems that uh, may lead to unrest. As I conclude, Madam Chair, I would like to encourage all parties concerned or tasked with the promotion of human rights to continue cooperating with us so as to help us in attaining better protections for all in our country. May I also kindly appeal that in cases wherein side events are being held in this uh, forum involving special rapporteurs of uh, state parties, such rapporteurs take, takes it upon themselves to ensure that the state party concerned and to be discussed is informed so as to promote the principle of natural justice expressed as the old Alteram Patem rule, which entails that each party must be given a hearing or be allowed to state their case so as to improve, uh, so as to improve the platform for working together. This is more so, Madam Chairperson, if the commission and such forums are to find solutions to such uh, social ills. I thank you. Merci, uh, distingué uh, délégué. Uh, je voudrais uh, féliciter le Royaume pour uh, <coughs> les efforts qui sont en train d'être uh, conduits et consolidés uh, en faveur uh, d'une meilleure représentation uh, des femmes dans les instances de prise de décision. Vous avez parlé du Sénat, vous avez parlé du Parlement. Uh, 
Euh, et euh, le fait que la constitution elle-même euh, contienne un quota de 30%, en espérant que euh, le gouvernement qui est en formation pourra respecter euh, ce quota. Nous engageons le Royaume à continuer à, à renforcer le cadre législatif pour euh, favoriser la promotion des droits de l'homme dans plusieurs domaines. Vos demandes en ce qui concerne la collaboration euh, sont bien notées. Je voudrais juste euh, relever le fait que les side events sont toujours euh, annoncés et euh, des affiches sont toujours euh, mises en évidence dans les couloirs, mais euh, il est toujours possible de, de renforcer euh, la communication avec les États présents. Merci. Kenya Human Rights Commission. Um, thank you very much, Madam Chairperson, Honorable Commissioners, State Party Representatives, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. Um, first, I'd like to thank my country for continuing to engage with the African Commission. Since the last session of the African Commission, a number of significant events have taken place in Kenya and in Africa. We would therefore like to bring to your attention human rights and governance issues that are of concern to us and require the attention of the Commission. Firstly, we note that the African Commission has seen steady and swelling threats and attempts to undermine its credibility and independence by individual state parties. The Executive Council Decision 1015 is an attempt to show primacy of the African Charter as the establishing authority of the African Commission through distortion. Cognizant that interference with the mandate of the African Commission represents a push against human rights and constitutes a violation of the African Charter and the Constitutive Act of the African Union, the Kenya Human Rights Commission urges all the African Union member states to boldly reframe the narrative of the African Commission, recognize and affirm its role as a monitoring mechanism of member states rather than a seemingly rogue organ of the African Union. We call on the African Commission to continue steadily to promote and protect the rights of all living on the African con continent without discrimination, fear, or favor, and affirm itself as a truly independent institution, breathing life to the Charter and a hub of accountability for human rights in Africa. Secondly, I would like to bring to your attention um, attacks on judicial independence mechanisms in Kenya. In Kenya, threats and attacks have been melted on the judiciary through a total disregard of court rulings, particularly those that have to do with state and state officers. Of importance are a myriad of decisions for the commencement of the Public Benefits Organization Act number 18 of 2013, which have been continually ignored. Secondly, the attacks have been uh, manifested through unfounded onslaught um, on judges and heavy and arbitrary budget cuts on allocations to the judiciary. All these measures risk undermining the effectiveness and independence of the judiciary. We implore the Commission to urge Kenya to desist from interfering with judicial independence and instead ensure thorough implementation of judicial decision and provide adequate funding for the judiciary to allow enhanced access to justice and furtherance of the rule of law. I wish also to bring to your attention um, the state of corruption in Kenya. While we acknowledge, um, while we applaud the political will shown by the president, we continue to reiterate the fact that um, actions taken to fight against corrup corruption must uh, be implemented consistently to allow uh, 
through the implementation of existing policies and legislation to win the fight against corruption. Given the African Union theme 2018 and the fact that corruption has been a major handicap the efforts in, in the efforts to realize human rights, we call upon the Commission to strongly pronounce itself on the issue of corruption and the duty of member states to deliberately address corruption alongside other key governance issues, pass one to their obligations to fulfill human rights. We also urge that the Commission encourages the government of Kenya to fully implement and domesticate the AU Convention uh, on Preventing and Combating Corruption. We encourage the government of Kenya um, to translate the President's pledge on fighting corruption into a comprehensive and objective process based on citizen participation, the rule of law, and our constitution standards on leadership and integrity. The fight against corruption must be shielded against any possible accusation of political bias. Um, also, the issue of electoral justice. The Kenyan delegation reported um, the recent reconciliation process um, that was previously preceded by other processes that were similar to those, including the Truth, Justice and Reconciliation Commission where victims shared their experiences and subsequently succinct recommendations were set out. There is also the Waki report. Unfortunately, um, the 2013 and most recently the 2017 general elections remain a testament that the recommendations and reports to government are even uh, to government are often ignored and for us we see that reconciliation of the elite has replaced justice electoral justice for the people of Kenya we encourage the commission to follow up on the promises made by the Kenyan government for justice of victims of election violence. We continue to call on Kenya to create mechanism for access to justice for Conclue victims of, of sexual violence um, by implementing, um, using, applying the guidelines of the AU. In conclusion, the KHRC notes that the statements made during the ordinary sessions such as this one, will be mere acts to practice one's oratory pro prowess before a con congregation, unless the Commission and its Commission stand up to defend the protection and promotion of human rights by being independent. We join our colleagues in, in declaring that this African Commission of ours shall be totally independent. I thank you. Royal Commonwealth Society for the Blend. Excellence, Madame la Présidente de la Commission, Honorable Commissaire, Mesdames et Messieurs, je m'adresse à vous au nom de Monsieur Amondongo, directeur exécutif du MIDH, qui ne pouvait pas être des nôtres aujourd'hui. Madame la Présidente, le 25 février 2015, la Commission africaine des droits de l'homme et des peuples, lors de la 17e session extraordinaire, a rendu la décision 318-06 sur certains aspects critiques du droit à la nationalité et le droit d'accès aux documents d'identité légale en Côte d'Ivoire. Dix recommandations majeures avaient été formulées, dont la révision de l'article 35 de la Constitution et la révision du Code de la nationalité pour les rendre conformes aux dispositions de la Charte africaine des droits de l'homme à la Charte africaine des droits de l'homme et du bien-être de l'enfant et aux conventions des Nations unies relatives à la patrie. En application de cette décision, il faut saluer L'adoption de la nouvelle Constitution, qui abroge la disposition jugée discriminatoire contenue dans l'ancien article 35, et l'adoption de la loi spéciale instituant une procédure simplifiée de la déclaration de la nationalité sur une période de deux ans, qui a permis de régler la situation de près de 17 000 personnes par l'obtention de certificats de nationalité. Par contre, force est de noter que le Code de la nationalité n'est toujours pas révisé privant ainsi des milliers de personnes en Côte d'Ivoire de jouir de leur droit à la nationalité, dont notamment les enfants trouvés et les descendants des migrants historiques. Le 18 novembre 2016, la Cour africaine des droits de l'homme et des peuples rendait un arrêt par lequel elle ordonnait à la Côte d'Ivoire de réviser sur une période ne dépassant une année 
C'est la loi numéro 2014-335 du 18 juin 2014, relative à la commission électorale indépendante, pour rendre cet organe en charge de l'organisation des élections dans le pays indépendant, neutre, inclusif et représentatif des forces sociales, et ce, conformément à la charte de la CDAO sur la démocratie, la charte africaine sur la démocratie et la bonne gouvernance, et la charte africaine des droits de l'homme et des peuples. Sur une requête de l'opposition euh, politique, qui demandait l'application de cet arrêt, le gouvernement avait répondu le 26 février 2018 par courrier que l'arrêt de la Cour n'avait qu'un caractère déclaratoire. Plus tard, soit le 6 août 2018, le chef de l'État a annoncé qu'il se décide enfin à réformer la commission électorale. L'opposition et la société civile avaient alors demandé, sans succès, que cette réforme se fasse avant les élections locales du 13 octobre dernier. Hélas, ce scrutin a enregistré des morts et certains incidents. Le 6 août 2018, le président signait une ordonnance d'amnistie de tous les faits liés à la crise post-électorale en Côte d'Ivoire. Cette ordonnance, qui succède à celle de 2003 et de 2017, promeut malheureusement l'impunité des violations graves des droits de l'homme, car ne prévoyant aucune sauvegarde en matière de poursuite des crimes internationaux dits « imprescriptibles », en ce qu'elle couvre toutes les infractions liées à la crise, sauf quelques rares exceptions. Ce critère est d'ailleurs d'interprétation très large par les politiques et les magistrats. Pire, cette ordonnance ne prévoit aucune contrepartie significative pour les milliers de victimes réperi répertoriées dans le pays. La réconciliation nationale ne peut être atteinte sans le respect des droits des victimes et de leurs proches à la vérité et à une réparation juste et équitable. Devant ce tableau de la situation des droits de l'homme dans le pays, le MIDH demande à la Commission d'inviter l'État de la Côte d'Ivoire à garantir le droit à la paix des populations et le droit à la réparation des victimes en honorant ses engagements internationaux. À cet effet, le MIDH appelle la Commission à inviter le gouvernement ivoirien à réviser sans délai son code de la nationalité pour le rendre moins discriminatoire et plus inclusif, à mettre en place un nouvel organe électoral inclusif, crédible, indépendant, et impartial, à rapporter l'ordonnance d'amnistie ou, à tout le moins, à y extraire les crimes internationaux, y compris les crimes sexuels et basés sur le genre, et à prévoir une contrepartie en termes de réparation aux victimes, à s'assurer que l'article 123 de la Constitution et les dispositions similaires des différentes lois nationales qui, qui reconnaissent la primauté des traités et accords ratifiés par la Côte d'Ivoire soient respectés et appliqué par les autorités compétentes, et enfin, à inviter la Côte d'Ivoire à faire rapport à la Commission sur les mesures prises à l'effet de mettre en œuvre les décisions des organes de, de droit de l'homme de l'Union africaine à son égard. Et vous ferez bien, Madame la Présidente et distingués commissaires, je vous remercie. Merci. Euh, vos préoccupations sont notées. Dici Wanelo. Madam Chairperson, Honorable Commissioners, all protocol observed. As the Botswana State Report will be reviewed during this session, Botswana Law, the Botswana Center for Human Rights, together with Botswana Network on Ethics, Law, and HIV and AIDS, Bonella, Lesbians, Gays, and Bisexuals of Botswana, Le Habibo, Community Media Foundation, the Center for Human Rights, University of Pretoria, Southern Africa Litigation Center, International Federation for Human Rights, FIDH, and Reprieve, submitted a joint shadow report to provide the Commission with information which is additional to that which is contained in the state report. Our issues are the following. The death penalty, freedom of information and expression, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, and prison conditions. One, the death penalty. Botswana carried out executions in violation of provisional measures issued by the Commission under Rule 98 of the Rules of Procedure of the Commission of Human and People's Rights. The most recent is the case of Patrick Rabak Agne. The Commission had ordered provisional measures on the 24th of February 2016 to stay the execution of Patrick Rabak Agne until various conditions had been fulfilled, including until the Commission had considered the complaint. Botswana executed Mr. Rabak Agne later that year. We recommend that the Commission call on the government of Botswana to comply with provisional measures in all cases and refrain from executing prisoners while their petitions are pending before the Commission or other international complaints mechanisms. Number two, freedom of information and expression. 
persecution of journalists and whistleblowers. Since 2015, there have been about six journalists detained over stories they carried in their publications. In one instance, the Directorate on Com Corruption and Economic Crimes used Section 44 of the Corruption and Economic Crime Act to stop coverage of ongoing investigations by the Botswana Gazette newspaper. Journalists involved and their lawyer were detained for some hours while their equipment was confiscated. In 2014, the editor of the Sunday Standard newspaper, Otsa Mokone, was charged as editor under sedition law for a story on the then President Kama. The writer of the story, Edgar Tsimane, fled to South Africa, fearing harassment by security operatives. We recommend that the Commission should advise Botswana to amend the Constitution to explicitly protect freedom of the media and whistleblowers, repeal the Media Practitioners Act of 2008, and amend the Public Service Act to not allow an employer to dismiss a worker for simply disclosing his or her legitimate views or information on the government or the president in the media in line with Article 9 of the African Charter. Point three, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression. Penal Code sections 164, 165 and 167 criminalize same-sex activities. Criminalization of same-sex relations perpetuates stigma and discrimination against the LGBTIQ community. We recommend that the Commission calls upon the government to, one, initiate community dialogues around decriminalization of same-sex sexual relations, two, commit a budget for human rights CSOs to advance human rights, three, work with human rights organizations, especially those working on sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, to advance the rights of the LGBTIQ persons through public education, four, repeal penal code sections already mentioned above, and five, initiate protective laws. Four, prison conditions. Civil society organizations working on human rights have limited access to prisoners, including death row prisoners. Former detainees report about the nutritional inadequacy of food provided to persons in detention, which compromises the health of all detainees, including those on HIV, and TB treatment. CSOs have been unable to verify these reports due to restrictions in access to places of detention and the lack of verifiable independent information on prison conditions, overcrowding and healthcare. In an article in the Sunday Standard, a former prisoner who had been held at the first offender's prison stated that it had a holding capacity of 170, but at the time of his incarceration, it had 427 inmates, and this was in 2016. We recommend that the Commission, in accordance with the African Commission's Resolution 19 of 1995 on prisons in Africa, encourage the government of Botswana to, one, include in its reports to the Commission under Article 62 of the Charter, information on human rights affecting the human rights of prisoners, two, to make public and accessible all reports of the prison visiting committees, three, improve compliance with visiting committees' recommendations insofar as these promote adherence to human rights standards. Four, establish an independent oversight body comprising persons with appropriate expertise to periodically monitor and report publicly on compliance with human rights and other legal standards in all places of detention, including allowing for unannounced visits and inspections for confidential access for all persons detained, and finally five, avail adequate financial and human resources for the full fulfillment of this mandate. I thank you. Associação uh, Constructado Comunidades. Senhora Presidente da Comissão Africana dos Direitos Humanos e dos Povos, senhores representantes uh, dos Estados aqui presentes, Uh, senhoras e senhores comissários, distintos delegados, caros colegas, minhas senhoras e meus senhores. Existem uh, duas preocupações em Angola que me fazem tomar palavra nesta sessão. Uh, a primeira preocupação li, uh, está diretamente ligada ao conflito de terras. Os conflitos de terra na região sul de Angola são muito acentuados por causa da tendência frenética de usurpação das terras comunitárias protagonizada pelos fazendeiros comerciais, vulgo, latifundiários e pelas empresas de exploração mineira. O mais constrangedor no meio de tudo isto é que no ato da ocupação das terras comunitárias não se observam os princípios normativos acautelados na Carta Africana dos Direitos Humanos e dos Povos. 
reafirma daqueles pressupostos legais que protegem as comunidades rurais. A inobservância destes princípios ocorre porque não há inicialmente diálogo ou negociação entre os ocupantes e as famílias afetadas, visando analisar as consequências daí decorrentes e ver a possibilidade de garantir a justa indemnização das famílias afetadas, conforme estipula o artigo 15º, número 3, da Constituição da República de Angola, enquanto norma superior da República de Angola. Por outro lado, inquieta-nos, sobremaneira, a atitude das empresas de exploração mineira, que consiste no incumprimento do princípio da responsabilidade social corporativa. Os gestores destas empresas, protegidos pelos governantes, desalojam as comunidades, instalam as suas empresas, exploram os recursos mineiros e, em nada, contribuem para o desenvolvimento das comunidades instaladas. Essas comunidades não beneficiam dos principais serviços sociais básicos, como a água, escola, postos de saúde, etc. A segunda preocupação é quanto aos direitos das mulheres. Na região sul de Angola, registra-se, por força do direito costumeiro, violação flagrante dos direitos das mulheres nas comunidades rurais. Esta violação é frequente nos últimos tempos, uma vez que elas não têm poder de decisão por força dos seus hábitos e costumes. Se eventualmente o marido falecer, a mulher não tem direito à herança, ainda que o patrimônio tenha sido adquirido em comum. Em caso de morte do marido, o direito à herança patrimonial é atribuído aos sobrinhos, isto é, filhos da irmã mais velha de entre as irmãs do falecido. Em muitos casos, após a morte do marido, a viúva chega ao ponto de ser desalojada de casa com os filhos. Por outro lado, a mulher é quase refém do marido porque mesmo que ela tenha sido abandonada voluntariamente pelo marido, ela não pode ter uma outra relação ou juntar-se com um outro homem. Para, tal, a, para que tal aconteça, o novo marido deve pagar multa ao marido anterior sob pena de sofrer represálias, perseguições, roubos, agressões, etc. Esses conflitos desembocam muitas vezes em, det em, em detenções mesmo estranhas, dando lugar àquilo que juridicamente se chama dupla sucumbência, Quer o autor, quer o ofendido, saem todos a perder. E é o que está a acontecer neste momento, onde temos uh, duas pessoas detidas por esta razão. Em suma, uh, por parte do Estado angolano, não se vislumbra para esta realidade concreta uma estratégia a curto prazo visando erradicar estes procedimentos consuetudinários que atentam contra a dignidade das mulheres nas comunidades agropastoris da região sul de Angola. Para terminar, gostaria de solicitar a Vossa Excelência, Senhora Presidente, para que sejam feitas recomendações ao Estado angolano no sentido de, primeiro, que seja aprovado um regulamento relacionado com a responsabilidade social corporativa para que todas as empresas extrativas saibam o que devem fazer, como devem fazer, para que, para que possam cumprir com o princípio da responsabilidade social corporativa. Que o Estado angolano realize conferências nacionais visando desincentivar a atitude das autoridades tradicionais locais que atentam contra a dignidade da mulher no contexto do UCOI e do direito sucessório. 
Muito obrigado, Vossa Excelência. Amnistia Internacional. Merci, Madame la Presidente. Chairperson, Honorable Commissioners, at the 58th Ordinary Session of the African Commission held here in Banjul de Gambia in April, May 2016, Amnesty International called for a renewed commitment to the protection of the regional human rights system in Africa. This call has now become more urgent in light of the decision of the African Union Executive Council to endorse the outcome and recommendation of the June retreat between the African Commission and the Permanent Representatives Committee. Amnesty International is concerned that the decision contains directive that unduly interferes with the independence and the autonomy of the African Commission. It gave the African Commission an ultimatum to withdraw the observer status it had granted to the coalition of African lesbian call. In effect, requiring the African Commission to replace its expert position with a political one. It directed the African Commission to submit its revised criteria for granting observer status to NGOs to the relevant African, uh, African Union political organs for consideration and adoption and, formulate, and to formulate a code of conduct for its members. These particular directives run counter to the spirit and letter of Article 42.2 of the African Charter which empowers the African Commission to independently lay down its rules of procedure. The Executive Council also decided to conduct an, analy an analytical review of the mandate of the African Commission to receive and adjudicate complaints of human rights violations and abuses. We are concerned that the true motive of this review might be to strip the African Commission of its invaluable and independent mandate to ensure protection of human rights in the continent. While we condemn this undue political pressure and interference, Amnesty International is deeply disappointed that the African Commission has already gone ahead and withdrawn the observer status it granted to the Coalition of African Lesbian in April 2015. In doing so, the African Commission has, contrary to the oath of office taken by its members, yield to political pressure and undue influence in discharging of its statutory duties. The decision to withdraw Carl's observer status is also contrary to the position that the Commission took earlier this year in its 43rd activity report. We urge the African Commission to remain true to its calling and as laid out in the African Charter and other re relevant regional human rights instruments. Amnesty International takes note of of the fact that in response to the Executive Council Directive, the African Commission has established two separate committees, first mandated to conduct a research into the issue of a code of conduct, and the second task with preparing a document on the question of, inter of its interpretative mandate. We welcome the establishment of these committees and we hope the outcome of these twin processes will boldly and clearly set out the position of the African Commission in relation to the recent directives issued by the African Union Executive Council. We urge the, the two committees to adopt a transparent process by seeking support and inputs from all relevant stakeholders and publicly share the, the outcome of their respective mandates. Most importantly, we urge the African Commission to, uh, to ensure that any future position it takes on its mandate and working methods is informed by a sound interpretation of international human rights law and one of, that upholds its independence and autonomy. I thank you, Chairperson. La FIDH, La FIDH, Seminit. Madam Chairperson, Honorable Commissioners, all protocol observed. The year 2018 has seen some advancement for a better respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms on the continent. FIDH wishes to acknowledge in particular the abolition of the death penalty in Burkina Faso on the 31st of May. 
We also acknowledge the implementation of a moratorium on executions and ongoing efforts of national authorities of the Gambia and their steady commitment, as reiterated during the opening ceremony of this session. It gives us hope for a definite abolition of the death penalty in this country soon. The two issues we wish to address are election-related violence and violations and the independence of the Commission. Elections. The Commission action is crucial in the fight against violence and human rights abuses perpetrated during electoral processes and to co contributing to the holding of credible, free, fair, transparent and peaceful elections. The African Commission and African states should take responsibility for putting in place favorable conditions for the organization of inclusive and credible elections, for guaranteeing free and open civic and political spaces, and to prevent and limit violence that could emerge before, during and after elections and the proclamation of final results. In this regard, respect and implementation of the provisions of the African Charter on Democracy, Elections and Governance should be a priority. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, General elections are scheduled to be held on the 23rd of December 2018. With less than two months before the vote, a lot still needs to be achieved to guarantee the holding of truly transparent, inclusive, free and peaceful elections and to avoid any contestation of the results which could lead to further violence, risking seriously destabilizing the country and the sub-region. The African Commission must take all necessary measures to prevent the outbreak of large-scale electoral violence, including by conducting a promotion mission prior to the elections. In Togo, the situation of human rights has continued to deteriorate since demonstrations calling for constitutional and institutional reforms in August 2017. Despite mediation efforts by ECOWAS to find a durable, peaceful solution to the current crisis, the Togolese population continues to suffer from violence, disproportionate use of force during demonstrations, and multiple attacks on freedom of expression, opinion, assembly, and movement. Legislative and local elections and a referendum on the constitutional review are scheduled in December 2018. The African Commission must strengthen its efforts for the implementation of the provisions of Resolution 397 adopted during its 62nd ordinary session in May 2018. In addition, the African Commission must closely follow the current post-election context in Cameroon, Mali and Zimbabwe, where security and political situations remain uncertain. In Burundi, the security and human rights situation continues to worsen three years after the start of the political, security and humanitarian crisis in the country. This year, the Burundian authorities have continued their campaign of terror, notably around the constitutional referendum of May the 17th, 2018. Between early 2018 and April, FIDH and Ligi Teka recorded 86 murders, 18 enforced disappearances, 77 cases of torture, 10 cases of sexual and gender-based violence, and 526 arbitrary arrests. The government continues to muzzle and suppress dissenting voices as illustrated by the attacks on civil society and human rights defenders and by the implementation of repressive and draconian measures. On the 2nd of October, the Foreign Ministry of Burundi announced that international NGOs operating in Burundi had all been expelled and banned from working pending their re-accreditation. The African Commission must strongly condemn these unjustified and inadmissible measures which will only have the effect of isolating and making more vulnerable the local populations who are already victims of serious human rights violations. Number two, the independence of the Commission. In light of this context and the countless human rights violations which African people suffer on a daily basis, FIDH and its member organizations in Africa are extremely concerned about the adoption of decision 1015 by the Executive Council of the African Union in June 2018 and its particular in particularly its implications for the fulfillment of the mandate of the African Commission. We believe that the Commission as an institution under the African Charter cannot see its independence limited to functional aspects without risking the undermining of its ability to act for the promotion and protection of human rights in the service of our African peoples. Our over 50 African organizations are also particularly concerned that the Executive Board's request to withdraw the observer status of the Coalition of African Lesbians was accepted by the Commission. We fear 
that the implementation of this decision signals potential increasing restrictions on civil society organizations access to the only institution of the African Union that allows and encourages interaction with civil society. Madam Chairperson, Honorable Commissioners, the institutional reforms of the AU are presented as reforms which will help to lead the continent to the Africa we want. We want an Africa that respects human rights and the rule of law. And to achieve this, the institutions of the African human rights system must have their mandates respected and their capacities for promoting and protecting human rights supported and not restricted. We urge you to continue and strengthen the fulfillment of your mandate in accordance with the African Charter for the promotion and protection of all human and people's rights, including non-discrimination, freedom of association, expression and assembly. I thank you. Civil society organizations and non-government organizations present, ladies and gentlemen, I bring with me greetings from the African Center for Treatment and Rehabilitation of Torture Victims. The status on the right to rehabilitation of torture survivors in Uganda. Introduction. Uh, the African Center for Treatment and Rehabilitation of Torture Victims, ACTV, has since its inception in 1993 in Uganda provided holistic treatment and rehabilitation survivors of torture, both Ugandans and refugees, and advocates against torture method both by state and non-state actors. ACTV has a diverse human resource comprising medical doctors, clinical psychologists, physiotherapists, nurses, social workers, and lawyers, with each of these contributing towards the holistic care package in the full recovery of a victim or survival of torture in Uganda and the Great Lakes region. Uganda expressly committed to the prohibition of torture by ratifying the United Nations Convention Against Torture, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. The Convention Against Torture requires effective remedies and reparation for victims and, where relevant, their families. Uganda ratified the protocol establishing the African Court on Human and People's Rights. The African Commission, in its general comment number four on the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, discusses the right to rehabilitation, emphasizing a holistic approach by the state. The Uganda Constitution guarantees freedom from torture and cruel treatment and makes these freedoms absolute. Uganda further enacted the Prevention and Prohibition of Torture Act of 2012, which provides for a survivor's right to rehabilitation. Background. On 19th April 2015 in Gambia, Banjul, six institutions, including the African Center for Treatment and Rehabilitation of Torture Victims, fronted rehabilitation as a key component in the life of a torture survivor. In their paper, it was stated that rehabilitation lacks sufficient clarity and is often translated medically as opposed holistically. The psychological and social effects of torture affect the victims as well as communities. The secondary victims are often overlooked by the state. In 2015, state funding for rehabilitation services was cited as a major challenge and that mainly non-government organizations were offering this component in Africa. Besides, state institutional mechanisms to offer this component were not in place. Although reparation was also identified as a necessary component in the pursuit for justice, risk of re-traumatization of victims owing to the lengthy legal procedures involved was also identified that rare do cause award rehabilitation measures as part of compensatory awards to a victim or survivor. Status in 2018. The African Center for Treatment and Rehabilitation of Torture Victims, together with ministries, departments, and different agencies of the state in Uganda, including police, the Uganda People's Defense Forces and the Uganda Prison Service continue advocating for the effective implementation of the Prevention and Prohibition of Torture Act in Uganda. The African Center would want to thank the Uganda government, especially Uganda prisons, for continuously allowing the center to access prisons, and also the government of Uganda for making torture a freedom, and a freedom from torture a right, but also making it an absolute right in the Constitution. It would want to thank the Uganda government for enacting the Prevention and Prohibition of Torture Act and passing the regulations in 2017. However, the African Center is still the only treatment and rehabilitation center for survivors of torture in Uganda. 
Rehabilitation services are yet to be mainstreamed in the health sector by the state. In the past seven years, from 2011 to 2018, ACTV has managed to register, treat, and rehabilitate 8,743 survivors of torture. Non-timely compensation of torture survivors by the state still persists. 1,807 712 US dollars is currently outstanding in compensation areas. The Uganda Human Rights Commission has also called upon the state to fast track this since it affects the recovery and rehabilitation of the victim, but it, this is yet to be realized. Uganda is yet to ratify the optional protocol to the Convention Against Torture of 2016, which allows unlimited access to all places of detention. We also lack a witness protection law which affects reporting of cases on torture. Recommendations to the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. The African Commission should task the Uganda government to give substantive reasons why the optional protocol, the Convention Against Torture of 2006, has not yet been ratified, despite Uganda having ratified the United Nations Convention Against Torture. The Commission of African Commission on Human and People's Rights should ask Uganda to adhere to the requirements of its general comment number four on the right to redress for victims of torture, which the African Commission adopted at its 21st extraordinary session held from 23rd February to 4th March 2017 in Banjul, the Gambia. It provides for provision of specialized treatment and establishment of rehabilitation centers for torture survivors or victims. Lastly, we would want the African Commission to task the Uganda government to justify the untimely compensation to survivors of torture, well knowing that justice delayed is justice denied. I thank you for availing us this rare opportunity, Honorable Chairperson, for God and my country, Uganda. We submit. Merci vos préoccupations sont bien notées. Uh, Human Rights Development Initiative. I would like to begin with the words of Professor Emmanuel Kwanza in an article on judicial activism in Africa. He said, and I quote, if the judiciary is to play an effective role in promoting constitutional governance in Africa, it is contended that it must liberate itself from being perceived as the handmaiden of the executive. It must act boldly and decisively to enforce both the letter and the spirit of the law. It is contended that the judges in Africa today must act as the last line of defense to arrest the looming authoritarian resurgence." End quote. Madam Chairperson, the independence of judicial and quasi-judicial bodies the world over are being threatened as I stand here. It is not a new phenomenon, and it is not unique to Africa. The US Supreme Court has for years been the subject of power contestation. The so-called political appointments of judges in domestic courts have been mirrored by what might be described as political appointments to international and regional human rights bodies. However, regardless of how and why a judicial officer is appointed, it eventually depends on how each individual deals with this power contestation. The independence of the institution depends squarely on the independence of each of the individuals that make up that institution. Indeed, there are rules and procedures that we can all invoke, but ultimately, it depends on how each individual chooses to decide speak, and above all, act. I am a firm believer in the fact that each individual has inherent within an indescribable reservoir of strength from which to rise up and respond to even the most oppressive and repressive regimes, individuals, and situations. I'm also an ardent believer in an inclusive Africa that embraces all, an Africa whose essential offering 
to the world is a simple concept, but one which is so often forgotten, that we all, each one of us, is because of the other. I am because you are. And that goes for everyone without any distinction. It is too difficult for me to conceptualize and abide within an Africa that is steeped within values of exclusion and to simply accept that as African culture. I cannot, we should not. The fight for an independent African commission began a long time ago. Many of you, many of us, fought bitterly to protect and strengthen the African Commission. This fight will indeed continue for a long time to come. But the question remains, how will this battle be resolved today? Let me end with the words of President Leopold Senghor at the opening of the meeting of African experts who gathered together in Dakar in 1979 to begin the preparation for drafting what we now call the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. He said, and I quote, the work which will be stamped with your respective names is exalting. Africa is watching you. It counts on you to ensure in the scrupulous respect of freedoms and rights the harmonious development of its civilization in the context of the worldwide civilization." End quote. May we be inspired. May we remember that Africa is indeed watching us and is counting on us. May we not let her down. I thank you. Merci. Center for Human Rights at the University of Pretoria. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair, Commissioners, everyone present. What brings us, states, commission, and civil society here is our joint pursuit to better protect the rights of Africa's people in all their diversity. We have just lived through the second year of the AU's human and people's rights decade in Africa, 2017-2026. However, Africa's people would be forgiven for feeling perplexed and disappointed and question the legitimacy of both the states and the African Commission to claim to be protectors of their rights. African Union member states have in the recent past taken extremely contradictory positions. When he declared the Human Rights Decade in June 2016, the AU Assembly pledged, and I quote, its unflinching determination to fully implement human rights decisions by AU human rights organs, and further, to ensure, I quote, the independence and integrity of AU human rights organs by shielding them from undue external influence. Regrettably, it turned out that it was not the specter of external influence by others, but undue influence by the AU policy organs themselves culminating in decision 1015 that undermined the independence and integrity of the African Commission. Decision 1015 aims to pull the carpet from under the African Charter system. The reason why these very states created the African Charter was to establish a system of independent oversight over the human rights enjoyed by the people of Africa. The African Commission, as autonomous interpreter of the African Charter, was placed at the core of this system by insisting that its own interpretation of the Charter overrides that of the Commission, the Executive Council has not only undermined the Commission's autonomy, but also subverted the AU's internal rule of law. There are many other aspects of Decision 1015 that concern us, including the request to the African Commission to revise its criteria for NGO observer status in line with the guidelines for accreditation to the AU. These guidelines stipulate that at least two-thirds of the resources of an NGO have to come from contributions from its members. 
as very few of the NGOs currently enjoying observer status would comply with this requirement, this request seems to be aimed at diminishing the role of civil society in complementing the role of both states and the African Commission in exercise of its mission in respect of human rights. We therefore plead with AU member states that have their people's best interests at heart to recommit themselves to the spirit and commitment set out in the AU Human Rights Treaties and in the Declaration of the Human Rights Decade and to premise their future engagements with the African Commission on the principle of its autonomy and independence. The African Commission also left us confused. In its May 2018 decision, it emphasized that it will deal with requests for withdrawal of observer status in a judicial manner, guided by due process, legality, and the African Charter. Regrettably, its response to the decision contradicts this promised approach in that it based its withdrawal of accreditation on the Executive Council's decision as such, implying that it was political pressure rather than legal persuasion that informed the Commission's decision. We therefore implore the Commission to act faithfully to the African Charter as the Commissioner's oath of office requires and to be guided by the rationale of its very existence, namely to better protect the rights of Africa's people in all their diversities. I briefly turn to the situation in two countries, Cameroon and Eritrea. The Commission has heard and was reminded that earlier this year it adopted a resolution calling for um, a general human rights mission to Cameroon in collaboration with the government authorities. Up to this point, this mission has not taken place despite the human rights situation still being dire. We therefore urge the Commission in its next activity report to draw the situation in Cameroon uh, to the attention of the Executive Council, the Peace and Security Council, and the Assembly with a view to this mission actually taking place. And lastly, in respect of Eritrea, the Commission has also heard and was reminded that despite the promise of the peace agreement between Ethiopia and Eritrea, that the um, situation of those detained since 2001 are still unresolved. This is despite the decisions that the Commission had taken on numerous occasions. In fact, we at the Centre have also taken note of further incommunicado detentions on 17 September 2018 of the former Minister of International Development and Finance that had been exposed um, before today. We therefore urge the Commission in its next activity report to draw the attention of the AU Assembly to this persistent non-compliance by Eritrea with a view to the immediate release of these detainees. Thank you very much, Chair. South Africa, s'il vous plaît, vous avez la parole. Thank you very much, Chairperson, for giving South Africa the flu. And uh, Chairperson would like her to present as follows. Um, to the Chairperson of the African Commission and Human Rights and hum Human and People's Rights, Honorable Commissioners, distinguished state delegates, representative of the National Human Rights Institutions, representatives of civil society organizations, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. The delegation of South Africa expresses its appreciation for the invitation extended to us to participate on the 63rd ordinary session of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights here in Banjul, Republic of the Gambia. The government of South Africa wishes to take this opportunity to express sincere gratitude to the government and the people of the Republic of Gambia for the warm welcome and hospitality extended to our delegation since our arrival in Banjul. Honorable Chairperson and Commissioners, the government of the Republic of South Africa recently hosted the African Commission for a promotion mission in September 2018. The visit provided an exceptional opportunity for both government and non-government stakeholders to engage with the African Commission on the state of human rights in our country. We believe that the engagements, discussions, and interactions were honest, fruitful, and contributed to the continuing effort to achieve human rights for all in our country. The mission further gave us an indication of the challenges we face as a country, and we highly appreciate 
the recommendations forwarded by the Commission through its preliminary findings. Furthermore, we are appreciative that the Commission is in constant contact with the relevant stakeholders in the country for purposes of finalization of the report of the promotion mission. Honorable Commissioners, let me report back on a few developments which this delegation alluded to in the previous session in Nokshot, Mauritania. The work of the Judicial Commission of Inquiry into State Capture has begun in earnest with serious allegations of corruption, fraud and colluding between politicians and private business people being unearthed. In September, the Minister of Finance resigned upon disclosure of his irregular interactions with private business individuals. Due to the amount of work to be done, the President has extended the Commission's work by two more years. On 20 September 2018, the Premier of KwaZulu-Natal Province released to the public the report of the Muerane Commission of Inquiry into political killings in the province. The provincial government is currently engaging in all stakeholders in the process of implementation of the Commission's reports. Following further consultations and submissions, the Cabinet has approved the adoption of the new revised mining charter. All stakeholders have expressed satisfaction with the revised mining charter. We would further like to report on a recent development on land rights versus economic rights of mining industries. Two days ago, our constitution made a ruling that fundamentally changed the power dynamics in land tenure versus mining companies. The court ruled that the existence of a mining license does not supersede the land rights of the landowners or communities in the land earmarked for mining activities. In essence, this ruling struck down eviction orders that were awarded in favor of mining companies. This is a major victory for the landowners and rural communities, we believe. An interministerial committee on land reform has been established to coordinate and implement measures to accelerate redistribution of land. In addition, a 10-person advisory panel has been appointed to suggest models for government to implement a fair, legislative, and equitable land reform process that redresses the injustices of the past. Increases agricultural output, promotes economic growth, and protects food security. That's the legislature. The constitutional review process of the parliament is also continuing to ensure that democratic processes, legality and property rights considerations are addressed to the full tr through the review of section 25 of the constitution. Our parliament is expected to publish soon the expropriation bill for public comment. The commission of inquiry into tax administration and governance has finished its sittings. The interim report has been availed to the president of the country and its findings and recommendations will be made public. Honorable commissioners, the month of October is the mental health awareness month with the objective of educating the public about mental health, reduce the stigma and discrimination and address challenges faced by people with mental disabilities. Policy interventions such as the Mental Health Care Act of 2002 make emphasis on the human rights of those with mental illnesses. In September, South Africa commemorated the annual National Albinism Awareness Month Chair. The focus was on the plight of persons with albinism through provision of information on albinism to make people more aware of what the condition is about. The government and other stakeholders began to domestic, uh, the domestication of the Regional Act Plan on Albinism in Africa 2017 to 2021. The government remains concerned with the recent killings and trafficking of people with albinism. The government condemns these crimes in the strongest terms and arrests and prosecutions have been made. The government is also committed to the promotion and the protection of rights of persons with disabilities and older persons. Some of the initiatives include centers for rehabilitation, public finding for these centers and provision of full-time care. 
The work of these centers has been additionally supported by the national and international NGOs. The older persons also receive the grant in aid as a direct payment to supplement their social welfare grants. Mutual support groups are encouraged to promote inclusion and equal opportunities for disabled people, particularly in education for the young disabled persons. South Africa is currently in the process of ratification of the two protocols, African Charter on Human and People's Rights, namely the protocol on the rights of the older persons and the protocol on the rights of persons with disabilities. We hope to deposit these instruments of ratification during the course of the year 2019. Distinguished commissioners, over the years, South Africa has implemented a number of legislative policies and other measures to ensure the substantive realization of provision of health care for all our people. In terms of health care, the National Health Act provides a framework for a single health system for South Africa. The Act further seeks to promote and protect a number of basic health care rights. This Act is supplemented by provision of the health, National Health Insurance, which was gazetted in June 2018 to create balance and equality between the private and public health care systems. During the recent Presidential Health Summit, the government committed to inject more funds to public hospitals and clinics. As of 1st January 2019, the government will zero rate sanitary pads. Revenue loss for this zero rate rating will amount to South African rand 1.2 billion, which is an equivalent of 85 million US dollars per annum. But this gesture will restore the dignity of girls and women. Distinguished commissioners, President Cyril Ramaphosa has launched a new sanitation appropriate for education, which we call it SAFE in abbreviation. This is an initiative between the government and private sector, which aims to fast track the eradication of pit toilets in the country's schools. With regard to the rise of education and school safety, the government has put in place various policies and measures to ensure the safety of all learners educators and relevant stakeholders in schools. Government interventions have, amongst others, focused on addressing elements of physical infrastructure and the strengthening of partnerships with relevant stakeholders, such as the South African Police Services. Additional measures are being put in place by both education authorities and the police to address school violence, which has recently resurfaced. Guidelines for the prevention and management of sexual violence and harassment have been developed and distributed to schools to support schools and school communities in responding to cases of sexual harassment and violence against learners. Honorable Commissioners, in order to address the challenges of gender-based violence, government has established the Gender-Based Violence a Command Center, Sexual Offenses Court, Kusela One Stop Center, which means protect, to Tuzela Care Center, which means comfort, and safety shelters for victims. All these centers provide immediate medical care, telephonic counseling, psychosocial support, and support services for victims of gender based violence. To date, 400 to Tuzela Care Centers have been established countrywide. Every November, we embark on 16 days of activism against gender-based violence, which is a national campaign to challenge violence against women and girls. The campaign runs from 25 November, coinciding with the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, until 10 December, which is International Human Rights Day. Government reiterates that it is the, the duty of every South African to educate one another on the rights of women and children and on the various uh, recourse mechanisms that exist to help victims and abuse and violence. Government condemns in the strongest possible terms the cultural practice of ukutwala and arrest and harsh uh, uh, punishly have been emitted on, on by our courts against the perpetrators of this practice. 
Distinguished delegates, we are pleased to inform the Commission that we are seeking good initiatives taking shape and seeing good initiatives taking shape about the rights of the lesbians, gay, bisexual, and transgender communities, LGBTI, both in the public and private sector. For example, the police services have developed the standard operating procedure on handling the LGBTI complaints, training of immigration officers on LGBTI rights. The crime of corrective rape is being lifted as a priority and perpetrators arrested to face the full might of the law. South Africa has also seen its fair share of hate crimes and hate speech. And racism remains a concern to government. We are, however, pleased to inform the Commission that the prevention and combating of hate crimes and hate speech bill will be passed into law soon. Furthermore, the courts have taken the initiative to impose heavy imprisonment uh, judgments on the perpetrators of these crimes. Honorable Chairperson, we are encouraged that the international community has recognized the contribution of our late President Nelson Mandela by hosting the Nelson Mandela Peace Summit during UNGA 73 in September. The UN member states unanimously adopted a political declaration that recognizes the period 2019 to 2028 as the Nelson Mandela Decade of Peace and calls for redoubling of our efforts in pursuit of international peace and security, development and human rights. In addition, the world leaders reaffirmed that each state has a responsibility to protect its population from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. They further underscored that civil society can play an important role in preventing conflict, contributing to peace building, and advancing efforts to sustain peace. Distinguished delegates, in conclusion, South Africa remains steadfast in promotion of peace, human rights, and fundamental freedoms in South Africa Africa and the world. This delegation would like to express the commitment to the government of the Republic of South Africa to work to the work of the African Commission and human rights uh, defenders and pledges its continued support to the African Commission, member states, civil society organizations, and all delegations here for constructive, fruitful deliberations. And lastly, Chair, this delegation cannot leave the floor without congratulating Africa for the declaration on the Mandela decade that started at the AU. And if it was not for the collective of the African Union, we wouldn't have seen what we have seen in the UN. I thank you, Chair. Nous voulons féliciter Euh, votre pays pour euh, la qualité des relations euh, qu'il entretient avec la Commission africaine des droits de l'homme et des peuples et pour avoir autorisé euh, une mission euh, qui a été conduite en septembre dernier par euh, trois commissaires et pour euh, toutes les dispositions qui ont été prises pour la facilitation de cette mission. Nous voulons également vous féliciter pour toutes les mesures que vous venez de nous décrire et euh, qui retiennent d'ailleurs un grand intérêt de notre part, notamment en ce qui concerne les initiatives dans le cadre de la lutte contre la corruption. Dans le domaine foncier également, nous euh, suivons euh, vos efforts Euh, les violences sexistes euh, que vous combattez euh, par le renforcement de votre cadre législatif. Nous sommes particulièrement intéressés à euh, connaître justement vos initiatives et les mesures que euh, vous avez adoptées dans le domaine de la santé mentale. C'est un domaine souvent négligé et sur lequel euh, la Commission et ses mécanismes vont se pencher. Euh, L'albinisme également et euh, la défense euh, 
des droits des LGBT. Vous avez également dit ce que vous êtes en train de faire pour punir les auteurs, les traduire devant la justice, les auteurs de crimes commis contre les personnes LGBT. C'est une thématique sur laquelle et des droits sur lesquels votre pays ne s'est pas souvent exprimé. Et nous sommes au niveau de la Commission heureux qu'un État parti s'assume par rapport à, à, à ces mesures-là. Nous voulons également euh, vous féliciter euh, pour euh, tous ces développements dont vous venez de nous parler et euh, vous engageons à euh, plus d'efforts de, dans le domaine de la promotion des droits de l'homme et, et des peuples et euh, justement à prendre toute la place qui est la vôtre dans ce domaine-là au niveau du continent africain. Merci. Je passe la parole à la délégation de South Soudan. South Soudan. Your Excellency, the chairperson of the African Commission, honorable members of the Commission, distinguished state delegates, representative of national human rights commissions, representative of NGOs, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of my government, I have the pleasure to present to the Commission the step being undertaken in improvement of human rights situation, especially with the signing of the revitalized peace agreement. On behalf, um, allow me, Mr. Uh, Madam Chairperson, you and the members of the commissions are aware of the recent revitalized peace agreement on the resolution of the conflict in the Republic of South Sudan. The core of the revitalized agreement is the permanent ceasefire, concluded by the parties on the 27th June 2018. Because of political will to achieve peace and continuation to sustain security, the government of national unity in the governance chapter of the revitalized agreement has gone an extra mile by accepting additional three vice presidents, 15 ministers, five deputy ministers, 218 members of parliament, and governance of 14 states out of 32 states to the opposition groups. The government believes that the immediate impact of conclusion of the revitalized agreement will be the alleviation of fear in which some people are living, living and suffering they have endured and restoration of their confidence in their government. Also, the revitalized agreement, as is stated by His Excellency the President of the Republic, will guide the government towards recovery, reconstruction, and shall lay the foundation for economic and social prosperity. One positive dividend of the revitalized agreement is the release of all those who were in collaboration with different rebel groups. On issue of transitional justice mechanism enshrined in the agreement, especially the hybrid court, the Tigono, which is the government of national unity, has formed a ministerial committee to discuss two points in the Memorandum of Understanding for the Establishment of Hybrid Court with the African Union Commission. But because majority of the members of the Ministerial Committee were involved in the marathon negotiation that led to the revitalized agreement, it is expected that the committee will resume the discussion of the two points as soon as possible. On issue of Commission for Truth and Reconciliation and Healing, sensitization and consultation with the stakeholders have carried out, have been carried out. 
The Government of National Unity has provided funds for the Technical Committee to compile the report for submission to the Council of Ministers and thereafter to the Transitional National Legislative Assembly for an enactment of the legislation for the establishment of the Commission. On the issue of accountability, the military justice since 2013 up to date, the general court martial has tried 204 cases, including the Terrain Hotel case. 23 cases are pending confirmation and six other trial. Sentences imposed in those cases includes 79 capital punishment, 52 dismissal from service, 31 imprisonment for various terms, and 31 reprimand and 11 field punishments. The military justice has recently recruited eight female judges, judge advocates, to investigate and oversight in court proceedings, cases related to GVV committed by soldiers while on duty. On the court, which is established to be trying the other organized forces, called the Joint Court for Organized Forces, the police from March 2018 to date has tried 74 cases of police personnel who committed various crimes against civilians while on duty. The accused have been convicted, sentenced to various prison terms, and all dismissed from service. Madam Chairperson, I would like to correct the misconception that amnesty being issued by the President of the Republic condone violation of human rights. The amnesty is restricted only to offenses against the state as provided in our penal law. Otherwise, the Rain Hotel case would have not continued if the amnesty included offenses of violation of human rights committed by members of the organized forces. In regards to children associated with the conflict, the, um, and the other armed groups, the government has recently released more than 607 children from non-state actors who had been, who had then reached an agreement with the government and became part of the Tigono, which is a national government. The release of children was made in two states of Goodway and Boma. In regards to improvement of prison condition, the population of prison inmates in the country has drastically reduced from 4,009 to 2,760. The reduction is due to the three factors which are release of those who have completed their prison terms, trial of those who were on remand, and reduction in rate of crimes. Regarding services to prison inmates, there are additional Im improve improvement in forms of pro provisions of blanket, uniform, bed, mattresses, and bed sheets for women in Juba prison and ongoing construction of juvenile center in Juba. In regards to police, the Ministry of Interior, in collaboration with the Ministry of Gender, Child and Social Welfare, established 17 special protection units with six in Juba. The functions of those units are to provide counseling, protection, and treatment to survival of GVB. Around 30 police personnel have been trained in investigation of GVV cases. On issue of social services, in June 2018, the Ministry of Gender, Child and Social Welfare launched a national strategy to, to end child marriage in the country with participation of 32 state governors 32 state ministers of gender, and 32 state director generals of Ministry of Gender. Also, the Ministry of Gender, Child, and Social Welfare is working 
on initial country report on the Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDO, and, and, as, and, and, and has finalized an initial report on the Convention of the Right of the Child for submission to the relevant treaty body com committees in compliance with country obligation under the conventions. On issue of capacity building, in June 2018, 50 senior SPLA officers were trained on child rights and the six grave violations, which are recruitment or use of children in armed conflict, rape and sexual violence against children, abduction of children, hindering of access to humanitarian organization, attack or occupation of schools, and killing and maiming of children. This brings the number of senior SPLA officers trained in the six grave violations to 219. Madam Chairperson, since South Sudan independence in July 2011, it has enacted about 140 pieces of legislation and domesticated various regional and international instruments. Among them are the African Charter on Human and People Rights. Convention governing as specific aspects of refugees problems in Africa. Convention on elimination of all forms of discrimination against women. And I will just conclude to say, um, in regards to the African instruments, the Republic of South Sudan is at the end stage of uh, ratification of Maputo Protocol. And I believe uh, not more than maybe the next month, it will, it will be ratified, it will be completed. Thank you very much. ...the defi multiple que vous rencontrez, mais nous voulons vous engager ainsi que toutes les parties prenantes à faire en sorte que les mesures en cours dans le domaine de la restauration de la paix et de la réconciliation soit euh, euh, effective, effective et euh, nous notons euh, toutes les initiatives qui sont en train d'être adoptées dans le domaine législatif euh, au profit des femmes, des jeunes euh, et nous vous engageons à beaucoup plus d'efforts de, par rapport aux journalistes, à leur protection, à la protection des ONG, pour qu'ils euh, soient autorisés à euh, mener leurs activités sans intimidation et sans représailles, puisque cela euh, nous est souvent rapporté. Nous engageons donc euh, le gouvernement de South Soudan de mettre en œuvre toutes les belles initiatives qui, qui viennent d'être euh, déroulées ici. Euh, à ce stade, je voudrais donner la parole à la République du Kenya. Du Kenya, c'est pour un droit de réponse. Kenya is taking the floor to briefly respond to issues raised by the Kenya Human Rights Commission before the session. Uh, Kenya is a constitutional democracy based on the principle of the rule of law and respect for human rights. The government has put in place significant efforts to build a human rights respecting state. It is important for the Commission and all human rights defendants to appreciate these efforts, which include the establishment of a, of a strong and independent judiciary, which conducts its work impartially and independently, with no interference from any person. It is not worthy that the Supreme Court of Kenya was the first court in Africa to declare a presidential election null and void due to elect election irregularities. Regarding the allegation of tr reduction of the judiciary budget by the government, it is important to note that this was not a selective measure targeting the judiciary, but an austerity measure that affected all government finance sectors due to financial constraint in the country. On the fight against corruption, we reiterate the statement of Kenya and stress that the fight against corruption is real buoyed by the goodwill of the president himself. The fight targets all public officers as well as the private sector. Already, a large number of high-ranking officials 
have been arraigned in court, including the country's sitting deputy, chief justice, former governors, cabinet secretaries, ambassadors, and even civil society organizations who failed to file financial returns in accordance with the law. Furthermore, the Office of the P Public Prosecutor has been provided with additional funding to prosecute the scourge. On access to justice, Kenya remains the most open country where anybody can access justice, whether direct or through other persons. The Constitution provides for public interest litigation. A fully-fledged national legal aid service has been established. The service is well-resourced and provides legal aid to the poor and vulnerable persons in society. A victim compensation fund has been established to provide compensations for victims of crime from 2014. Madam Chairperson, we have a peaceful, stable, and secure country where all civil society organizations, national human rights commissions, and all persons operate freely. The country, the government works closely with these organizations for the betterment of all Kenyans. Indeed, the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights, the National Gender and Equality Commission are all funded by public funds to address issues of human rights. We must emphasize that this enabling environment created by the government must be treasured and strengthened by all to allow for the continued promotion and protection and peaceful enjoyment of human rights in our country. I thank you, Honorable Chair. Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Commissioners, State Delegates, Representatives of National Human Rights Institutions, members of civil society organizations, and distinguished participants. The Kenyan section of the International Commission of Jurists and the Independent Medical Legal Unit are grateful for the opportunity to deliver this statement on the state of human rights in Kenya, Burundi, and South Sudan. With regards to the human rights situation in Kenya, we welcome the enactment of the Prevention of Torture Act No. 2 of 2017, which came into force on 20th April 2017. The objective of this act is to provide for the prevention, prohibition, and punishment of torture and cruel, inhumane, or degrading treatment or punishment and reparations for victims of torture. The act's eventual passage owes a great deal to the concerted efforts of civil society organizations, the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights, members of parliament, and the invaluable support of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. However, we are concerned that the act has not been fully operationalized and no perpetrator of torture has been, has been charged under the act. We call upon the commission to urge Kenya to fast track the implementation of this act by developing clear regulations under the act through a consultative process with non-state actors, investing in immediate capacity building of actors in the administration of justice sector, including security and law enforcement officials, judicial officers, prison officials, prosecutors, among others, and carrying out sensitization amongst members of the public on an ongoing basis to ensure that the populace understand the provisions of the act and support its implementation. We also welcome the directive by the President of Kenya in 2015 during a State of the Nation address directing the establishment of a restorative justice fund of 10 billion Kenya shillings. The fund was meant to be used for restorative justice to provide a measure of relief for victims. However, the fund has not been set up due to absence of clear implementation guidelines, thus hindering settlement of reparation claims. We call upon the Commission to urge the government to facilitate the issuance of compensation to the victims of state-perpetrated torture, cruel, degrading, and inhuman treatment who have received favorable court orders but are yet to be compensated. During the 2017 elections in Kenya, the police used excessive force leading to deaths and injuries of thousands of citizens, especially in opposition-dominated areas. We are concerned that the victims are yet to be compensated by the government, no perpetrators prosecuted. No tangible investigations have commenced, no measures undertaken to address the rehabilitation or compensation of victims and their families. While we appreciate the Commission's public pronouncements concerning the situation during the elections, we call upon the Commission to urge Kenya to 
send a clear message against impunity by facilitating full investigation of 2017 election violence and facilitating the compensation of the 2007-2008 post-election violence and prosecution of perpetrators. We decry the escalating numbers and incidences of extrajudicial killings in the country. Law enforcement agencies in Kenya have continued to employ execution as a much more favored approach to implementing rapid solutions to social and political challenges engulfing the country in the name of promoting public order and public safety. According to a recent report by the Independent Medical Legal Unit, at least 822 people died from extrajudicial killings between 2013 and June 2018. Of these reported cases, 58 people were executed by the police between the months of January 2018 and June 2018, despite the existence of a number of constitutional bodies, policy, institutional and administrative frameworks and reforms intended to ensure that the police service and the entire security sector is, in, is reformed, the government of Kenya has failed to sufficiently address extrajudicial Conclue. killings Conclue. and has instead Conclue. demonstrated Conclue. a callous disregard for the right to life of the citizens by taking no action against the death squads within the police institutions. We applaud the Commission for spearheading the launch of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights Principles on Decriminalization of Petty Offenses in Africa. The launch of the principles is very timely because of the continued detention of petty offenders that propagate the criminalization of poverty in Kenya. We urge the Commission to call upon the government of Kenya to decriminalize and classify petty offenses in Kenya and implement the African Commission on Human and People's Rights Principles on Decriminalization of Petty Offenses in Africa. Thank you. Merci. Vos préoccupations sont bien notées. Nous donnons à présent la parole à Action Internationale pour la Paix et le Développement dans la région des Grands Lacs. D'emblée, euh, je précise que je fais une déclaration conjointe de l'AIPD et de SIRAC. Madame la Présidente, nos organisations sont gravement préoccupées par la situation extrêmement critique qui prévaut actuellement dans la région des Grands Lacs et plus particulièrement en République démocratique du Congo. Malgré les engagements pris et les promesses faites par le gouvernement et la communauté internationale, aucune mesure de décrispation prévue dans l'accord de la Saint-Sylvestre n'a été prise à ce jour. À preuve, les opposants politiques comme Diomi Dongala, Franck Diongo et Mouyambo sont toujours détenus arbitrairement et n'ont donc pas pu présenter leur candidature à l'élection présidentielle. Les candidats à l'élection présidentielle n'ont pas bénéficié du même traitement par la Commission électorale nationale indépendante qui a privilégié les candidatures des complaisances au détriment des véritables opposants politiques. La machine à voter est rejetée par tous les acteurs politiques, par le peuple et par les experts en informatique est imposée en violation du code électoral. Au plan sécuritaire, il faut mentionner la poursuite des massacres des populations civiles à Béni, dans l'Ituri, dans les Grands Kassai et à Kinshasa par des groupes armés bénéficiant du soutien logistique des pays voisins. Les cas d'arrestations arbitraires, d'enlèvement d'activistes des droits humains et d'opposants politiques, les assassinats ciblés en vue de faire régner un climat de terreur préélectoral, les exécutions sommaires et arbitraires ne se comptent plus. Dans son rapport du mois d'août et voire même du mois de septembre dernier, le Bureau conjoint des Nations Unies aux droits de l'homme à Kinshasa indique que sur l'ensemble du territoire de la République démocratique du Congo, les agents de l'État sont responsables de 409 violations, soit 66% des violations documentées au mois d'août et un peu plus au, 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 en août 2018. Les quatre objectifs principaux poursuivis par les Rwandais en République démocratique 
du Congo sont claires. 1. L'occupation territoriale et l'extermination. 2. Le pillage des ressources naturelles au profit des multinationales. 3. La balkanisation. Et 4. L'annexion de la République démocratique du Congo comme étape finale. Madame la Présidente, nous sommes également préoccupés par les violations des droits de l'homme des migrants subsahariens en Afrique du Nord, souvent dans des conditions qui choquent la conscience humaine et violent les instruments internationaux en la matière. En Angola, nous assistons à l'expulsion violente des migrants, parfois établis de longue date dans ce pays, sans susciter la moindre protestation forte de la part des instances internationales et régionales. L'armée angolaise a tiré à balles réelles sur un groupe de Congolais accusés à tort de se livrer à l'exploitation illégale du diamant, particulièrement à Lunda Norte, où on dénombre déjà plus de 20 morts. L'expulsion des migrants vers les provinces du Grand Kassai est surprenante et constitue un cas flagrant de, de non-assistance à peuple en danger, au regard des informations récurrentes et crédibles faisant état de la poursuite des massacres de population par des miliciens Banamura à la sorte du régime Kabila. Nous demandons à la Commission des droits de l'homme et des peuples de tout mettre en œuvre pour faire cesser ces expulsions et ces massacres qui continuent d'endiguer le peuple congolais, déjà meurtri par des décennies de dictatures féroces. Madame la Présidente, pour conclure, nous venons d'être informés de la tenue imminente à Genève sous les auspices des Nations Unies d'une rencontre de haut niveau de protagonistes de la question du Sahara. Nos organisations exhortent toutes les parties concernées par ces dossiers à faire preuve d'ouverture afin de donner une chance ultime à la résolution définitive de cette crise. Je vous remercie, Madame la Présidente. Merci. Vos préoccupations sont bien notées. Euh, la parole à l'État légal, défense et assistance projet. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. This is a statement of the legal situation in Nigeria on the need for human rights accountability on the grounds of social orientation and gender identity in Nigeria. Nigerians and human rights organizations in Nigeria are concerned by continuing human rights violations based on the real and passive gender orientation and sexual identity of persons. In very recent times, documented reports show an increasing trend by law enforcement officials in Nigeria utilizing laws that criminalize same-sex relationships to target poorer and underprivileged Nigerians for their real or perceived gender orientation and sexual identity and expression. In the absence of social and economic resources to enforce their rights, the victims of this socioeconomic profiling are susceptible to harassment, intimidation, and extortion by law enforcement authorities. For example, in 2017, 42 men were arrested at an HIV testing and counseling meeting in Lagos and subjected to abuses of their dignity and human rights before finally being charged to court. Recently also, 56 men in Lagos were also arrested based on their perceived sexual orientation These persons were detained and charged before a magistrate court in Lagos. However, both incidents involved the arrest of people who are already socioeconomically disadvantaged and who form part of lower classes of society. Poor and young Nigerians are often targeted by law enforcement officials who often stop and search them and sometimes make out physical abuse and monetary extortion. Discriminatory laws and policies continue to criminalize persons for real or imputed sexual orientation. And the Nigerians who most suffer the effects of these policies are persons who are disadvantaged socioeconomically. This is a blatant violation of their fundamental rights, particularly in terms of their freedom of assembly and association under Chapter 4 of the Nigerian Constitution and also under Article 2 of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. Nigerian Same-Sex Marriage Prohibition Act of 2013, as well as other provisions of Nigeria's criminal and penal codes and provincial Sharia laws continue to be enforced against the intent and wording of Nigeria's 1999 constitution, as well as against the 
intent and wording of the African Charter. We note that both the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and the African Charter, which is ratified and domesticated as Nigerian law, prohibit discrimination and guarantee rights of expression and association. The African Commission on Human and People's Rights has, via Resolution 275, condemned acts of violence and other human rights violations against persons based on their imputed or actual sexual orientation and gender identity. We note also that the Commission, via paragraph 126 of its concluding observations and recommendations in its fifth periodic report of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, called for a review of the Same-Sex Marriage Prohibition Act. We therefore implore the Commission to invoke its protective mandates to call on one, the Nigerian police and other law enforcement bodies to discontinue socioeconomic profiling and other practices that target poor and vulnerable Nigerians for their real or perceived sexual orientation and gender identity expression. To call on the Nigerian police and other law enforcement bodies to investigate incidences of socioeconomic profiling and other practices that discriminate against poor and vulnerable Nigerians for their real or perceived sexual orientation and gender identity expression. Three, that the Nigerian government should develop and publicize anti-discrimination guidelines for law enforcement bodies and hold the Nigerian police and other law enforcement bodies accountable for discriminations and human rights violations based on perceived sexual orientation and gender identity. Four, that the NHRC, the Nigerian Human Rights Commission, should develop and publicize guidelines and indicators on the protection of human rights of persons based on their sexual orientation and gender identity and expression. And finally, that the Nigerian government should implement the commission's concluding observations and recommendations in its fifth periodic report. Thank you very much. <laughs>